And we're live. Hey everyone. Uh, welcome to That Paddle Show VCQ. Dan here. Mick here. Hello. Mick at the helm, at the controls. He feels powerful and like in control, as you would assume. Uh, yeah, how's it looking? All good? I think so. Oh, well, wonderful. Yeah, so welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on this glorious Monday afternoon. All a bit um, warm and lovely. Some might say a bit close. Do they, is that a term used in Australia? Hush now. Uh, uh, my nan would say it. Or indeed up that Australia. Up the Australia. Uh, as my, we say my nan's here in did Somerset, Dorset. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wondered if it might be an Englishism. It oh, is sorry. an Englishism, sorry, a but my nan, would, my nan would, 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 did, used to. A bit close. There's not a, there's, oh no, not restart. Not restart. Don't restart. That's not what I wanted. Didn't want that. You software updating in the middle of ECQ. I am absolutely not software <laughs> updating. This Mac is from about 2011. And I think, and if I software updated it, it would go. Do you know what iOS you got on that? Don't, just because I did it all yesterday to my son's um, laptop. Uh, Desert Ocelot. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Now I've got the beach ball. About this Mac. This is scintillating, isn't it? Uh, Catalina. Oh, there you go. 10.15.3. Very good. Uh, oh, no, okay. hang on, it's 2015. <sighs> You're the height of technology. Relatively modern. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, hello. <laughs> um, for those of you new to us, this is a live viewers' comments and questions section that dear Daniel and I do on a Monday. Yes, generally, well, we say talking about the video that we did on Friday, and we welcome questions about uh, that, but just an excuse to hang out with y'all. Yes, indeed. Um, so yeah, ask us what you like. Just logging in, as usual, failing to do so. One day in the future, Dan, live streams will be ready to go. Can you imagine? Hmm. Zoot Alors, greeting from Long Island, New York. Ah, uh, Long Island. Yep. Yeah. Actually, lots of love to um, all of our friends in New York and everyone out there. Yeah. It's been a tough week. Hope everyone's uh, doing okay. Um, uh, Aaron Dempsey from Florida. Um, where are we? Uh, Dave Reed from Shrewsbury. Ah, uh, Shrewsbury or Shrewsbury, would we say? Well, I don't know. It's probably like scone and scone, isn't it? Yes. What's the fastest food? Scone. <laughs> Very good. What's the fastest food? It's gone. Milk, because it's pasteurised before you can see it. Very good. Very good. I'm not a father to humans. I think I'd do an alright job. With the jokes. Oh okay. oh, okay, okay. No, you're doing good. Yeah. You're doing good. Yeah. Uh, Jonas Tava, hello from Seattle. Hello to Seattle. We mentioned Seattle last week and someone said, you didn't mention Jimi Hendrix. I think that was the, first, did, the person, first, thing we did. first person we mentioned. Of course. Yeah. Um... Who else we got on, Dan? Uh, we've got Like Lions. Good morning from Y and Skill New NY. New like York. Lions? What's that, like a panther that's gold? It's like, yeah, yeah. They're <laughs> like lions? Yeah. Not quite. <laughs> Imagine being like a lion. God. Uh, Raphael Youngers. Hello from Belgium. NY. Hello to Belgium. Indeed. Just look at the Belgians. Uh, Daniel Herbert. Hello from Ann Arbor. Uh, thanks for your reply to my question in the comments on Friday's show. You're welcome. So one thing that Mick does beautifully, I do less so. Um, Brawner advertising. Because we've we're, brawn, we're manly men. We've had brawn, we've had Apple Pay, and we had some other really great ads this week, so um, please watch the ads. Um, might be able to afford that old strat after all, Dan. <laughs> Not. Uh, um... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, what's this one? Click, click attack Washington from Jim Lane. Click attack. That's cool. And oh, John Foss. Big hello from Alaska, everyone. Ah. I only know uh, of Alaska through uh, the Simpsons movie. It's all of my knowledge about Alaska, <laughs> and it's just wonderful. <laughs> I know very little about Alaska, but yeah. 
the Simpsons movie when uh, they all moved up to Alaska. Right. It's beautiful. You don't watch I Show Truckers then? No, I don't. Um, oh, but there was a part in um, Malcolm in the Middle. Right. Where one of the boys moves up to Alaska. Best show ever. Right. Yeah. Anyway, there we, uh, George Spigot, good morning from Melbourne. Um, big hello to all of our friends out in Australia. Hope you're all doing great. Still locked down uh, in there, uh, uh, hey. down there. Yeah, yeah. Pretty pretty severely in, in a lot of cases as no well. No way, I didn't know that. So, how, you know, hope it's all going well. Um, David Daly, greetings from sunny Southport. Hello, Southport. Went there once. Put some tents up for a flower show. Nice. Yeah, big tents. Big tents up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christopher Neiman, we had him already. South Wales, Robert Payne. Hi, oh, Robert. Lovely. Yeah. Um, uh, Peter Hollyman says, Hello, boys, Mick. Any new mods or progress on the Isabel telly? Um, none, Peter. Uh, it's sort of sat there in the rack. I had two weeks off and um, didn't play the guitar blissfully in those two weeks. And um, no, it's sat there. And I'm not allowed to play it in. Well, I am allowed to play it in the show, but I don't play it in the show because two tellies is like too much, man. And Dan will be like, <laughs> The thing is, you sound so good on the telly, then I pick up my telly and all my dreams shatter to dust. Very silly. Very silly. Very silly. Very silly. Um, no, I shan't be doing any more mods to it. I might put a white pick guard on, but apart from that, no more mods required. Just need to um, kind of get with it, really, and... and, and Do its thing. And learn it. Mm, uh, such for, a great guitar. For want of a better... Uh, for want of a better thing. I, I, I know the day is going to come where I'm tempted to put some more pickups in it because the pickups are, compared to Red and compared to the 60, Dan 65, it is a little bit weak sounding. But that oh, but is its it, trump it, yeah, card. Yeah, absolutely. That's its trump card. Yep. But it is quite hard, you know, when you, if you sat here next to Dan, I, and I've done this for five years now, being sat here next to Dan when he's playing Red is like, it's like I'm always driving the Fiesta and he is always driving the Lambo. Because... None of my... All, no, it's the Fiesta my... with the extractors on. Yeah. <laughs> Just same speed up to you, but going... I, I, I always choose my guitars because they're um, they're weak. I like weak guitars. And Red is just not a weak guitar, is it? Indeed. Um, anyway, that's probably too much explanation. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, OK. Let's get into the questions. Shrewsbury says... Uh, Anomalous result. Anomalous result. Okay. Shoesbury, spelt uh, as in shoes, the things you wear. Man, the the pronunciation of names here. I got I got in trouble once for calling it Salford. Oh right, <laughs> yeah. Salford. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. On the subject of geography, do you know where the Andes are? Uh, mountain range in. On the Andy Aristides. <laughs> oh man, my kids are in for a treat tonight oh, when I get home. Oh. Guys, wake up. I need to tell you something. Magic Man says, any tips for someone just getting into recording? I have everything I need, but I still don't understand my DAW lol. Um, well, our tip is, the good news is that all DAWs are fundamentally the same. Okay. But ostensibly very different. As in you know, software that does one thing. It does the same job, yeah. i.e. it accepts a bunch of stuff you t you put into it, it arranges it, and you can then edit it. So it does the same thing. Um, the layout, uh, the basic functionality will be the same, but the way it's laid out and finding your way around it is different. So the advice would be whatever your chosen DAW it, it is, and it really doesn't matter what it is, um, just start from the beginning. Any decent software company worth their salt will have a lot, a huge range of online video tutorials. Start at the beginning, beginning, don't expect to know it all in a minute, and just start working right from how do I connect it? How do I get sound in here out of there? That's very much easier than it used to be 20 years ago. <laughs> I, I, genuine PTSD from buying a PC in Cubase once and spending two days trying putting sound in. Just get the Atari. And not getting sound out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's largely not a problem these days. And then just you record something, play it back. Yep. 
um, add a plug-in, literally start from the beginning. That's that's the advice. Bazooki Man 5000 was very upset that we didn't pronounce his name. There you go, Bazooki Man 5000. Name pronoun unless you. I wonder you if that's Phil X. No, no, it should be. Phil um, X plays the Bazooki. I have uh, dear Mr. Paul Stacey coming up this week. Cool. So we've got our first uh, re rehearsal of a rehearsal this Friday. Nice. This, yeah, yeah. And but we're filming. So basically, I've so got for not Tin Spirits. Exactly. Yeah. That's the, the, the yeah the the uh, new spirits. The lead fumes. The original. The, tin spirits. the new originals. So he's coming up to help me. Uh, we're going to film and talk about mixing because the EP is basically recorded. Yeah. And he's going to take me through three or four things to stop the EP sounding like a demo, and make it sound like a record. So we'll be filming that on Friday. <laughs> It'll be fun. I like the way that's even, even slightly possible in less than twenty five years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not really, is it? Uh, but for those of you who don't know uh, Paul Stacey, friend of Dan's, uh, friend of mine, more of a friend of Dan's, who is a well, number one, a utterly phenomenal guitar player, unbelievable, like Book of Ag level guitar player. Yeah, it's just, just. So I would good. go to when I first met Paul. He was playing for Neil Finn. Uh, with his brother Jeremy, and then I would just go to all the gigs that he was doing, yeah. just to sit in front of him and, and watch him play. And utterly astonishing yeah, player. Yeah. Not you know, not in the sort of Matteo Sassato really impressive kind of way. Just in a well, he he can play really impressively, but in a connected, musical, passionate, moves you from the bottom of your soul yep. way, which is yep. not to say Matteo Sassato doesn't do that, but what I'm saying, he's not like that all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's more like one chord and, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, anyway, and, but he's also a producer, been on tour with loads of people, um, just actually produced Scott McKeon's new record, which sounds unbelievable. Spectacular. Um, yeah, that's who, that's who Paul Stacey is, yep. uh, if you didn't know that. Yep. Yeah, because when so Tin Spirit sort of disbanded, we all got the itch to play again. Um, Dave is busy doing other things and sort of wants to take it easy and um, so I on a on a wing and a prayer I called Paul and said I suppose you'd be interested in coming up and he's like yeah sure which is unbelievable so yes first rehearsal this Friday I'm very excited very 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 cool uh, right into the super chats then yeah, uh, Mark Lavinish is on first tonight hello Mark hey, nice Mark. to hear from you as always he says, I just got my Page TS, Kingsley Page TS from Simon. Wondering if you've tried one and what your thoughts are on it versus the Page. Um, do you have any of his amps? Um, easy bit first. No, we don't have any of his amps. We've it's heard the them. Page TS. The Page TS is the regular Page circuit yes. with more features and controls for versatility and a wider range of sounds and applications. Like many of our pedals, the Page TS is hand wide. Oh, hang on. I see it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, second foot switch for EQ lift, uh, providing boost, preamp mode. Oh, oh it's okay. Got a full, full EQ and stuff. Amazing. So, okay, so it's a page. For those of you who don't know, this is Dan. Okay, so this is the Kingsley page. So it's a valve uh, booster. Absolutely gorgeous. Of you know, it's been on or around my board for years and years. Um, the, he does a number of different sorts, so I think that's the page DS, which is the uh, almost like a Dumbly type preamp. Yeah, so it, it's slightly confusing because there's a page tube boost, which is the pedal that Dan is referring to, which goes on your pedal board mm -hmm. like any other uh, overdrive or boost pedal. Sounds totally glorious as a, just a straight boost. There is also a preamp version which is designed to hit, well, actually it's designed to run after another Kingsley preamp and then hit the power section of a guitar amp. It's essentially, this, in this case, you, know, I see it says, you can't see, but it says DS on the back. Um, that's a Dumble Overdrive special voiced one which sits after my Maiden pre. What it looks like, Simon's put all of that into one pedal. Wow. By the looks of things. Amazing. Um, haven't tried one. 
but Simon has a hundred percent hit rate <laughs> with anything of his we've ever tried. Just listen to the guy play, yeah, and you'll get a you get an understanding of just how meticulous his ears are and his touch. It's really amazing, you know. When I hear there are some designers that I've heard play who have blown me away and I'm like, oh, okay, now I understand where you're coming from when you design. And Simon's, you know, man, he's just, you know, he's one of my favourite guitar players. Um, his, obviously his harmony and all this sort of stuff is outrageous, but when his touch yeah. and the way that translates through in his pedals is like, ah, oh, just wonderful. Can't say enough. Awesome. Well, like congratulations, Mark. Hope yeah, you well really done, like mate. it. Awesome. Um, one thing with something with so many sounds in it and with so much power is that um, it, sometimes it can just take a minute to find the place you like and for sure when anything is that powerful tonally there'll be some sounds in it you definitely don't like so yeah. if you're in that ballpark at the moment don't be put off by that it's just par for the course with getting the gear, learning it, finding where it sits best for you and just optimising that yeah because all those knobs are interactive right yeah, they're, yeah. they're all interactive so you know and that's to circle round on something Dan said earlier, you know, that is the one feature of Simon's playing that comes through so strongly in his in his pedals. I'm at risk of stumbling into a giant canyon of generalization here, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um I'll be joining you in two seconds. <laughs> one thing I've always found about Simon's stuff, Kingsley's stuff, is that the way it reacts to you as the player is on another level compared with most stuff. Certainly compared with, if your only experience to date has been like digital modeling amps, which basically don't do any of that, mm. uh, they just they just seem to sound the same no matter what guitar player or anything else you put into them. To me anyway, Simon's pedal will sound radically different whether you pick hard or soft. And oh. that, that's been one of the challenges for me, balancing up some of those yeah, combinations right. of yeah, them yeah, is sure. really learning that because, anyway, laboring the point. Nice one, Mark. Andrew McNeil. Hello, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Um, good morning from sunny Alberta to my two favourite people. Ah, bless you. That's very nice, Andrew. We genuinely hope there are more favourite people in your life, um, but we are we are nonetheless touched. Um, will we get to see the Cali Tweed um, have any more love on the show soon? It's such an amazing sounding amp. Deserves all the love it can get. Filming with it tomorrow. Funny you should say that. Yeah. yeah. We're going to do a show that we spoke about ages ago, and it's called something along the lines of where do you go after the Hot Rod Deluxe? Yeah, yeah, it's such an interesting question. And of course you could go in many directions and at this point the comments section will explode with people going, try this, try this, try this, try this. We don't have everything in the world. What we do have are some sensible suggestions on where you might want to go after a Hot Rod Deluxe. Bearing in mind a couple of things. Number one, it's got to have some headroom. Mm. Um, number two, it's got to have a pretty nice fendery clean channel. Yep. So we're we don't not want to gonna... set we don't want to step sideways, right? No. We want to move moving forward. We're not going to martial or heavy game. We're going just, you know, the fendery thing. Yeah, no step change. Exactly. In in basic tonality. But there are some th some things that a lot of people get really annoyed about the Hot Rod Deluxe. So we're gonna look at that. And one thing we're gonna suggest is the Cali Tweed. You might say the Fillmore is a better option, but we don't have a Fillmore. We do have a Cali Tweed, and it's an interesting point of discussion. So there'll be a lot more of that. Probably won't be, that'll probably be about three weeks time. Yeah. So uh, yeah, look out for that, Andrew. Hunter. Mick, could you explain the difference between a Custom Shop 335 and a Collings i35 LC? I'm in Austin and would love to support Collings, but I'm not sure how close to the 335 sound it is. Um, briefly, Hunter, the biggest, biggest, biggest difference is the body is an inch shorter across the lower bout. So 335 is 16 inches across, I think, um, and an i35LC is 15, and they did that for a couple reasons. They felt that it was a more ergonomic design. One perennial uh, problem with 335s is the amount of low-end feedback resonance you get when you play them live. Now. You could equally argue that down the years, plenty of people have managed very successfully to play 335s without them feeding back. However, um, I know that Bill um, and Aaron there, who worked on that guitar, were very keen on making it a more balanced overall instrument. Okay. That was a big part of it. I think in addition to that, it's constructed in quite a different way. Right. 
What's this? What's the three? The small body three three five. Is it a not three three six? Three three six or nine? Right. Yeah, and that's even smaller again from Gibson. Right. Um, I, the thing to do is to play them really. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a Collins guitar. It's, what's it like? If you're used to normal Gibson and Fender electric guitars, seeing a Collings guitar is like, it's like seeing your first Bentley after you've only ever seen Fords. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with a great nice Ford. Nothing wrong. At all. No. Nothing, in fact, been hiring vans recently and the Ford basic transit custom is so much better than the basic VW van. It's so, that the engine is better, it goes like stink. Awesome. So please don't think I'm knocking Ford, but Collings is just another. It's just another thing. It's like two Fords. <laughs> like Fords and stereo. <laughs> no, because then you'd have. Twi anyway, um, <laughs> and some people really love that, and some people really don't love that. Right. So I would say go play one and have a listen. Um, I don't think there's any doubt. Like a nice custom shot 335, as long as it's nice and lightweight, nitro lacquer, all the things that you'd want from a vintage style 335 with nice pickups, is gonna sound more like a vintage 335 than a than the yeah. i35 LC will. Partly because of that um, difference in body size, but also you know just in the way they're made. Yeah. So um, yeah, I have actually ordered an i30 LC. Which is still oh, over a year no. away. That's amazing. Still over a year away. But anyway. There well, we I've been filming. Uh, anyone that follows us on Instagram will have seen my pictures this week of me um, with Johnny Kincaid, Johnny building my guitar. <laughs> I'm filming the whole thing. It's so exciting. Um, popping up to Bristol every Wednesday morning just to sit there for a couple of hours with him. That's really cool. What's that about? Another 10 weeks out, did you say? 10 weeks out. Yeah. That's exciting. Oh, man, oh, I'm so excited. Dan's having a custom acoustic guitar made. Well, when, when we had our guitars refretted, I basically ordered it then, which was two years ago or something. And it's That's like... That's how back ordered he is. Yeah. And there's no, it's like, this is where you are on the queue. That's how much it is. My Bloomin' Collings was 16 months and there's loads of them. Man. <laughs> yeah. But it's wonderful. Like, watching him bend the timber with an iron by hand. Mm. It's like the years that have gone into yeah. him being able to do that, and then he puts it in the the tablet thing, and he just goes, Boom. "What are you having like, the sides made of?" Uh, rosewood. Yeah. Any idea what rosewood? It's, it's rosewood. It's pretty. <laughs> it's very <Okay>. pretty. <laughs> I've got, he tells me what all the all the the wood is. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. But it's beautiful. Can't wait to see it. Oh, man. Thomas Nicholson, uh, good evening from Burnley. Hello to Burnley. He says, I've got a rat. Hudson, I'm guessing broadcast. Mm -hmm. JHS DB double barrel and a JB2. I've got space for one more drive. Or should I get a compressor? What pedals would you recommend? Well, let's get see. Get something fuzzy. Yeah. Get something angry and fuzzy in there. I mean, the broadcast will do that. Mm. The rat we know is just a great distortion. The JB2 is an angry Charlie and a blues driver. Okay, so you've got you've got and a nice double... gain range there, but what you don't have is something that's really spitty and you know find a nice. What is the double barrel? I think you've got two angry Charlies then, haven't you? Or is that the sweet tea? Oh, I get confused. I'm not sure. Dan's right. I would say you don't need any more overdrive pedals, personally. Yep. What you don't you have is something overtly mid-boosted, unless yep. the double barrel does that, unless there's a tube screamer in the double barrel. Yeah, mid-boosty, clonny, or fuzzy. Yeah. And it depends what else is on your pedal board, of course, because if you don't have a delay pedal, then we would say buy one forthwith. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, compressor compressors are interesting. Um, depends what you're playing. Depends the app you're yeah. using. I think Thomas, a more specific question would be would be helpful. I.e., what do you want to achieve? Because I think we can all get into that mode where we look down at the pedal board and go, "I need something else." Mm. And the question should be, "I want to achieve this sound." Yeah, and that makes it a little bit easier to yeah, get what to. Yeah, what do you what do you feel you're lacking? You might hate fuzz. 
Um, but you might say, yeah, I want to get some white stripe sounds or whatever. Yeah. You know, see if you can narrow it down that way and, and uh, choose accordingly. Nice. Very good. Um, octave pedal. Octave pedal, there you go. Because that will augment your various fuzzies uh, uh, and uh, driveys. Get one that goes down and up. So like the Boss OC5, for example. Or get the prescription electronics Cob. Clone, the cob that only goes up. Yeah, but I think it goes up in the best be way. Really good fun. It, well, it can be, but that's not. We're not. We're out. Of, that's. I. I don't put that in the gain section. Okay. You know, whereas the cob, I absolutely would put in the gain section. The funny thing is, right, whenever we were playing, and I could, you know, I'd be playing and playing my heart out, and you'd step on the side, it was awesome, and then you'd step on the octava, and everything changed, not just. The octave gave you somewhere else to go. Mm. Like you've got all your game stuff, your fast stuff, yeah, yeah, and then... Like most blokes are on you know, 10. Th they're on 10, all, all, the all across, across the board. All the 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. <laughs> and then the uh, the cob for you was, was 11. Yeah. You, ha you had somewhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that when the GCSE results came out. Congratulations to everyone who got great GCSE and A-level uh, results. Congratulations to my daughter, Liv. Who, yeah, who just basically wiped the floor with but I, I was thinking about Nigel when you were telling me how many A star stars Liv had got I was like well, you're on 10 <laughs> you're on A all the way across the board and where can you go these ones go to A star it's like why don't well why don't you just make like A, A <laughs> the highest and have that be one louder this one's got A star right there you go you see uh, that so, is like, funny. Totally the wind out of the sails of anyone who's happy with their A star grade. That is funny. Um, in my day, it just used to be A. Oh. And it just wasn't so bad that everyone felt, you know, everyone who got B was actually a D. Right. So no one feels quite so bad. <laughs> is that how it works? I don't know. <laughs> Angry comments below, please. <laughs> <laughs> Swizz871 Swizz871 says I'm very excited to get my Reeves Black Hat sound this week Ah oh, yes Good on you And Man. Marcus is on actually Marcus is uh, on hey, tonight Marcus. He's in the chat He's on holiday um, And is on the chat on holiday Marcus Dedication Love Yeah man <laughs> Hope you've got a beverage uh, To be with us with We've got actually We do have a new pedal from Marcus this is, this is the red dot sound. I just want to show you the finish. Look at this. Look at that. It's so nice. Marcus etches, uh, I don't know if all, but certainly most of his enclosures. Um, that's his first facey type one with a few little tweakers. So we'll be hearing that on the show soon. So good. And again, for those of you who don't know, Marcus um, hand makes pedals in England in the most astonishingly point to point hand wired way. Go to Instagram and look for Reeves Electric. Electro. Reeves Electro. Sorry, go to, go to Instagram and look for Reeves Electro. Follow him. And follow, follow them, him. But you've got to check out the, you've heard of point-to-point -point wiring. This is ridiculous. Um, and I first heard about Marcus after, as I follow Brian Wampler on Instagram, yep. and Brian posted says, you've got to check this out. And I was like, it was just amazing. So yeah, big big fans, Marcus, great work. Anyway, so Swizz871's just got his black hat sound. And the question he has for us, Daniel, is if you could do a grand tour of music stores around the world, where would you go? Oh boy, the first time I went to LA to the, uh, not Vintage Around LA, what's it called? Um, is it the Guitar Center in LA, the, the, the big vintage section? There's a few good guitar in stores in LA, but I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's the Guitar Center in Hollywood that's got a massive vintage section. And I mean, I've been to a few guitar centers in my time and they're great, but far out, man. I'd go to all the ones that I follow on Instagram, like uh, BC Guitars, wherever they are, up north in America somewhere. Norm's mm. Rare Guitars, obviously. Norm's Rare Guitars. Is it, uh, uh, is it 28th Street Guitars in New York? Uh, I'm not even sure if that's there anymore. 
40 seconds. Um, Carter, vintage guitars, of course, in Nashville. Walter Carter, the acclaimed writer, has a, or the formerly acclaimed writer, has an amazing guitar store there where Zach Mythos used to work. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, right. When we went to Japan with Boss, and we walked down the... Um, oh, my word. Was it Shibuya? I don't know, oh, the district. Man. But just the most unbelievable street full of guitar things. But, yeah, I'd go to all those independent... Um, vintage dealers that are online yeah uh, that we follow on Instagram and just because I love that whole idea of stuff go coming in and out and all the stories they've got to tell um, you have to see a modern Amazon type guitar store you have to uh, you have to experience it so uh, Toman in Germany I'll never forget that. Music store in Germany. Uh, and we'd have to mention Sweetwater in the US. Yeah. It's, if you've never seen anything like that, it's, it's literally unbelievable mm. what they do. And it's, you know, for us who are sort of sat in a little room talking to a, a camera, you go to these places and it's really inspiring. This is how many people on a daily basis are, you know, grabbing guitars and, and things to make music with. It's like, oh, yeah, right, okay, cool. Um, Tom Ann yeah. old, was just colossal beyond words. Yeah, it's... it's um, a Brief explanation. You put your order in. Uh, basically, two things start to happen. One, order goes off to the warehouse, and depending on what the various product is, either a robot or a human will pick that product, zip up on a massive, you know... Matrix style thing, Keanu Reeves comes out like, all that. Ooh. Anyway, it ends up, and then secondly, off off goes a another electronic message to the packaging department, which says, "I need a box of this size, this volumetric dimension, in order that it's going to have in it a um, a cable, a strat, and a polishing cloth." Mm. And these two like massive things start to happen in in uh, in harmony, where they finally end up in one place, where the box comes along on a conveyor belt on one thing, and then the items come down from outer space, and then there's either somebody in the middle to just go right on a little else LED uh, screen. It says pick one thing next. It comes off. You pick it and you put it in the box. It's behind you. That happens like 4,000 times a day. They've got their own DHL depot. I remember seeing that. On site. There's this loading bay with like, lo you know, like when you see a distribution centre for a supermarket. Mm. And you, you come over the motorway and you see it like 10 miles away and you think, oh, that's quite big. And then you get there and you literally can't see either end of it. That's how big it is. And all the lorries queued up to, you know, get filled up with lettuces and stuff. Well, in this case, it's not let I. It is <laughs> it's guitars and stuff. And the scale of the operation is truly unfathomable. Yeah. Anyone who does, you know, work at Amazon or drive a van for Amazon or... I mean, everyone works for Amazon these days, so more and more people will be aware of it. We'll know exactly what this looks like. Mm -hmm. But in the world of music retail, it is utterly staggering the first yeah. time you see it yeah. you you might be even minded to say that it's a bit soulless that it's a bit heartless that it's not really what music is about i don't even want to go there it is an amazing feat of organization engineering and precision so german yeah but their returns department is bigger than most music stores right but they've i mean so they've got 120 people working in the the call center so they speak they speak like 20 different languages just answering inquiries product specialists all in, that stuff in most languages yeah, yeah. yeah. really anyway so, interesting. Anyway. so yeah you uh, in addition to all those cool little uh, vintagey places that have got 54 strats i think you also need to see the behemoth place that sells 200 squires a day yeah sure yeah martin yeah. cable martin's martin you've been astonishingly generous Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And he's got three things which we'll read out in turn. Um, he says, Hi, gents. I've been catching up on the last few weeks before your break as the old mental health went a bit sideways. 
I have to thank you both again for your honesty. It helped me. I could ask for the help I needed. Martin, uh, we hear you. He said, I was just a bit late doing it. I'm on the men now, though. That's good to hear, mate. And it seems that you were playing more of what you want rather, rather than more of what you should. So if you are learning something you want to play, must you know it technically perfectly before you can put your own spin on it? Or can you make it yours from the start? Does technical perfection lack soul? That's question number one. Question number two, when does reverb become delay and when does delay become echo? <laughs> okay, so to sort of roundabout way of answering your first question, I was on uh, driving on the way here today, I was listening to Radio 4 and this amazing documentary about Elgar came on, oh. really famous uh, British composer. And... The uh, famous orchestra, I think it's the the the, the Halle. Anyway, mm. they were playing um, Elgar's theme of variations, and the, the the conductor says, "Well, I expect everyone to know all the notes because woe betide them if they don't." He said, "But then my job is to help them know uh, why they're playing them." and how, you know, to, to play those particular notes. And he was taking, taking you through the, like, you know, almost like the visual aspects of what this piece was about and helping, the, you know, helping all the orchestra play together. And it was fascinating. You, you don't, you know, before you can put your own spin on it, you don't have to know things absolutely perfectly. Sometimes the spin can be because you can't play it exactly like the original. Yeah. Um, you know that stuff isn't isn't important. It's what you want to say with that piece of music, and and you know it's like um, okay, I got home, we had we had dinner with our neighbours on Saturday night. I'm still hurting from the Jaffrazi I had. It was awesome, but oh man, it's so hot. Anyway, I got home and my daughter's in the lounge room, and my favourite song ever ever written is America by Simon and Garfunkel. Really? And, yep. Absolutely, wow. that, that song, there's no rhyming in any of the lyrics throughout the whole song, <laughs> blows my mind. I mean, and it just, it's, this, it's the visual imagery of that song and it just kills me. And I've never played it before. And Liv was downstairs singing and, and for some reason I just heard the, I heard the chorus. Anyway, I picked up the, the guitar, started playing it and just singing it and she was harmonising. It was like a different tempo and a different... Thing we're just you know feeling it as we went, but because I know the song so well, even though I've never played it before, yeah, we sort of worked our way through it, and it was a really special moment, you know, um, yeah. So and I hadn't sat there you know learning it exactly how they they'd done it, yeah, but I knew the song well enough, yeah, yeah, to sort of be able to do something with it, and that's you know, it's a different sport, isn't it? Yeah, because. You know, most of us, I would say, spent, actually, no, it's too much of a generalisation, a lot of guitar players, especially guitar players, I would say, drummers too, but especially guitar players, obsess about playing something, you know, either note for note or in exactly the same way that Jimmy Page or Eric Clapton or David Gilmour or B.B. King or whoever it is you want to mention did and that's that becomes our focus doesn't it and then what what happens pretty quickly is that some guitar players find that they're naturally pretty good at that right and some guitar players find that they are utterly hopeless at it yep and again we all develop in different in different ways but the true originals are probably the ones who are pretty hopeless at it yeah I, I, I totally agree. And with they that. go off in their own direction yes. as as um you know, um what is it? Necessity being the mother of invention and all of that. And it is inter personally it's an interesting question, Martin, and I'll I'll pick you up on your mental health point because um me and Dan both spend a lot of time obsessing about guitars and have done that and playing for all of our lives because it's what we do, right? Mm -hmm. We've been lucky enough to to forge that into actually, you know, it paying the mortgage. And recently I've been going through a thing where I've disconnected from the guitar in a big way because I just don't feel like 
I've got anything to say on it. I Every time I pick up the guitar, I'm like, I have literally nothing to say here. And I think that is the result of being totally obsessed with trying to sound like everyone else my whole life. That is so interesting. And I'm sort of, and again, I don't, <laughs> very guilty of overthinking everything. And that's, you know, that in terms of where poor mental health is concerned, that is literally the worst thing you can do. What So what happens, so Mick has this amazing capacity to sort of absorb everything and process everything all, process everything all at once. And I think, because you see the big picture of everything and you see all the process behind bringing that to the fore. So when you're, when you, when you're playing or something, you know, and you, you like, you know, you hear Tom Bukovac, for example, you're not, you're not listening to the one line he's playing. You're listening to the whole thing he's doing and you just go, oh man. Yeah, That's, maybe. That is how you get there is just so <laughs> epic beyond words. It is, and it, and it becomes an insurmountable task because you start catastrophizing and you start yeah, comparing yeah, yourself yeah, to other people. Yeah, that's so, so interesting. What's at the core of your question maybe is um, a little bit of uncertainty about how you see yourself versus other people, and versus mm. is the op operative word because it being versus is where it all goes wrong. And all of us, all of us, just need to get over it. Yeah. Because what you what you also allude to is putting your own spin on it, and that's all you can ever do. Yeah. Because totally. what happens? What happens if you can play it exactly like BB King, and nobody can tell the difference between you? What then? Yep. Yep, that's so true. What use is that to anybody? Yep. Apart from maybe you might get 15 million views on on YouTube and earn a bit of money, but it's no use to anybody, is it? Because yeah. he's already done it. So the best thing any of us could ever do is put our own spin on it, is to speak, is to have something to say on the instrument, not get too tied up on trying to be anyone else. Now, if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago, I'd have had a completely different answer yeah. because I was really happy trying to sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan and, and trying to be everybody else. But now I find it a very hollow experience wow. to, to follow that. Now, of course, what we I will finish this soon, I promise. What we shouldn't do, or what, what no, you can't say what anyone should or shouldn't do. What I want to start doing is stop thinking about it. Right. Because that's where it all goes wrong. And actually, if you spend 20 minutes going, oh, should I play it like this or should I not play it like that? And you find, we all do it, don't we? You get up in the morning, you start thinking about something in the shower, you're thinking about, oh my God, I hope my tone's okay today. Um, and the more of that you do and the less time you spend connecting with the instrument, the worse it all gets. Mm. So if you do ever find yourself in that position of, of not really knowing where you are, I, I often think the best thing you can do is just pick up the guitar, try and turn your brain off. And every time you start thinking about it, stop thinking about it and just make a noise. Mm. It's quite, take some training. Yeah, totally. But um, it's the best cure, I think. Yep. yep. So uh, anyway, Martin, sorry to hear you haven't been so good. Glad you're in a better place. Yeah, well done, And I um, hope that answers your question. Does technical perfection lack soul? Absolutely not. Oh, man. Listen to Julian Bream play classical guitar. Yeah, listen to... tell me that that isn't just... Listen to Guthrie play anything. Listen to Vi play anything. It, it, if it doesn't connect with you, that doesn't mean it lacks soul. Yeah, it yeah. just means it doesn't connect with you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It, it, it... Someone mentioned today, like, uh, you know, on a slightly sideways note, you know, we hit with the show last week with the Deluxe Memory Man. And I yeah. and whenever I play it, I'm like, oh, man, why would I ever play anything else? And someone in the comments today said, yep, Deluxe Memory Man, sounding as bad as it ever has. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like, wow, because we all hear things differently. Yeah, yeah, we do. You know? So just do your thing. Yeah. Whatever connects with you. The whole thing is about finding what connects with you and just... Yeah. Go down that road and don't Just worry about it. anything else. Yeah, it's so easy to say, yep. so very, very, yeah. very hard to do. Yep. But there you go. There I you guess go. that's why we're alive for three score and ten, or yep. a bit longer than that if we're lucky. I think by the time you take that penultimate breath, you go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, before I forget, BV, uh, mate. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much, uh, as yeah. always. Absolute superstar legend. Big shout Thank out you, to BV, who uh, is moderating and doing an amazing job of it. Yep. Chris Stacey. Um, hi, Chris. We've got a, a super chat from you, but no chat. So we'll check back in a while just to see if uh, if we pick one up somewhere. Actually, I'd better just check to see where we are as well. OK. Uh, yeah. OK, at this point, I'm going to turn the super chat off. 
because we will not get to them all. So if you've super chatted to this point, we'll answer. If you haven't, please don't, because I'm going to turn it off. Okay. Hope Ho Roni says, my plane lacks soul, but I assert my authority nonetheless. <laughs> yes, mate. Well, it is, I mean, again, I'll just mention Paul Stacey very briefly. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. He was saying he had a very simple part to play in a Tom Jones song. It was a super simple part. It was the kind of part you could listen to and play within 10 minutes. The song was called Burning Hell, a song he did with his brother, Jeremy Stacey. So just three of them, Paul Stacey, Jeremy Stacey, and Tom Jones, and you can see it on Letterman. So go to YouTube, search Burning Hell, Tom Jones, and you'll see the tune Mick's talking about. And continue. Yeah, and I can't even remember what the lick was, but he said he spent... Hours and hours and hours and hours just playing it until it was he part of felt him. it was a part of him. Yep. And I'm like, wow. And wow. you hear it and it's like, ah, oh, it's so powerful. So powerful. Yeah. So good. Um, right, David Daly. Hello, David. New guitar day. Oh, nice. I just picked up a Gretsch G5222 Electromatic Double Jet BT Walnut. Wow. Okay, Electromatic, mid-range Gretsch, Double Jet, uh, that's a jet isn't it? Is a Double yes. Jet a double cutaway I jet? I believe so. Yeah. BT, Broadtron pickups nice. in Walnut. So kind of kind of, kind of, of a little bit malcomy, we would say. Oh, we? That, nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. I'm properly loving how it sits between my Cabernita and Les Pauls. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the reason I've connected with this Gretsch so much is because it it does sit in that place. It's like, it's got all that twang and that sparkle and top end that I love, but far out, man, it rocks like nothing else. Really, yeah, wonderful guitars. Oh, that's a cool guitar. That is a cool guitar, actually. Oh, yes. Yeah, there we go. Very nice. This is the uh, Gretsch that we're talking about. Come on, come on, Lucas. Focus. Focus. There you go. Lovely, really lovely. Yeah, yeah I had a, a, a sort of double cutaway doozy that looked a little bit like that, the Star Player TV. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those. I remember, I remember an old, an old, uh, the vintage Joe Jet that I saw in a vintage and rare in London when it was still vintage and rare. I don't, I don't even. I think it's changed now. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, this beautiful black duo jet. And they had a sparkle jet version of the same oh. thing. They make some amazing guitars. One of the most bizarre reissues of a guitar I've ever seen was Gretsch 90s <laughs> issue, <laughs> sparkle, sparkly jets. Right. So they made a bunch of sparkle jets in the 90s. Chris Cornell was a fan, actually, or at least oh, wow. he played one, as, as far as I can remember. Um, but it's just bizarre guitar to decide to, to reissue. reissue. Yeah, right. Uh, anyway, they are current um, and very cool. Uh, Nick Jurek, Nick Jurek or Jurek, he says, uh, Mick, at one point in the Analog Delay video, you said, I want to be in a punk band. Me too. So, what would yours and Dan's punk band rig look like? Uh, it would be just my AC30 red and treble booster. And it would be so angry. Uh, mine would be my junior, my Collings 290 nice. DC. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, probably a Plexi, but it would have to be a 100-watt Plexi. It couldn't be a 50-watt Plexi because it's just not loud enough yeah. without overdrive. So I just want to be Joe's drummer in the punk band. But I would have an analog delay, and I would use it like flangy... Slapbacky, angry. Yeah, yeah. Very Mind cool. you, you know what? Um, Sex Pistols, very divisive punk band. Um, some people thought they were punk, despite popularising punk for the whole world. Mm -hmm. I think punk. Some punk fans don't regard them as punk. They were very well produced. What? Because they are so successful. Don't know. Don't know. Okay. Anyway, don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm on thin ice here. All right. <laughs> Whatever you do or do not think about the Sex Pistols, let us gloss over that. Steve Jones's guitar sounds. Fender Twins, wasn't it? Maybe. I've never heard a Fender Twin sound like that. No, 
No. Um, but it looks like, the pictures on stage looks like cranked twins. Yeah, but the studio sounds yeah, right, on the yeah, records, right. yeah, yeah. Like, even yeah, if it was, I mean, there, there would have to have been pedals involved or yeah, at least yeah. some post-processing. Just fantastic yeah. rock guitar sounds. Yep. Really, really fantastic rock guitar sounds. Patience, my pet. So, um, yeah, shout to Steve Jones. I mean, I'm assuming he played on the records. That's the other thing, isn't it? Because you just don't know with that whole no. old caper, yep. do you? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming he did, and I don't want to cast any aspersions to suggest that he did not. Great guitars, great guitar sound. Yeah. But not what I associate with a punk guitar sound, which is scrappier, brangier, more aggressive. John Pardo says, what did Chris Spedding play? I would love to know. I would love to have a chat to Chris Spedding. Just to find out what he played in the War of the World stuff? <laughs> no idea. No idea. Will he get back to me? Will he eck? Anyway. <laughs> um, anyone else to, chiming in? Uh, Detroit invented, invented punk, not London. Yeah. I, um, I, yeah. Yeah. I've watched documentaries on it and I can't remember. Mm. Um, Scott Lombard says, Joe Perry's tone on Walk This Way was a Fender Twin. I can totally believe that. Wow. Um, yeah, 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 just to see if anyone else is. Magic Man, I'm looking to buy one of the new Supro Delta King series amps soon. Fantastic clean. Nice, nice. Be good to try one. Yeah. Um, anyone else coming in on the punk thing? Single songwriter says, The Jam, London Calling. What's uh, the YouTube video? They're playing in the rain. <laughs> yeah, it's not punk if it's not raining. Is that right? <laughs> Best punk band with the Stranglers, says Tom Robinson. Uh, new album out soon. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dream Theatre are on tour in April. Possibly the least punk band that have ever existed, along with UB40. Um, it's close. Uh, please ask Music Man to get John Petrucci on the show. I just would not know what to say to John Petrucci. Hmm. Hey man. I mean, how would be, how would be my first question? I heard some live Dream Theatre. Um, so, uh, Mark, the bass player from Tin Spirits. It's not hard, Mark. It's not hard, Mark. Um, I played my kids that uh, last week, and wet themselves laughing. Anyway, he played me some live Dream Theatre stuff, and I've never heard live guitar like it. It's unbelievable. It is. It is literally unbelievable. Um, but. You know, from a purely personal point of view, I just have it. Just like, yeah, I, I just don't get it. Yeah, which is not to say it's not amazing and millions of people don't like it because clearly Excuse millions me. of people yeah, absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah, if you go to the Reading Festival, there's three kids that must be walking around at like four hundred miles an hour because I only ever see three T-shirts: ACDC, Rush, and Dream Theater. Oh, and the odd Guns N' Roses one, worn by an ironic girl who bought it in Topshop because she don't know, she doesn't know who Guns N' Roses are. She likes roses. <laughs> yeah. She thought Gun might be a bit anti-establishment. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. very un unprofessional to say all of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I had to. I think I had to interview him once, or write something on them, and I listened to three albums back to back, and by the end of it, I was just none the wiser. Right. Literally none the wiser. Which is how a lot of people feel about the music I love. So it's, I'm not saying. Yeah, yeah, we all love different stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember going to, I've been to concerts where I was like, gee, uh, you know, that was, that, was, that was two hours. And other people crying. Yeah. You know, it's like everything touches. Well, differently. otherwise, you know, to, to be massively reductive about it, all music it would, would be, be the same, exactly. wouldn't it? And that would be really yeah. boring. Yeah. Uh, Jason Clute. No question, I just saw the Black Crows over the weekend and each ah. guitarist had three amps each. Rich had two yes, Marshall 212 did. combos and one AC30 and they put a mic on every speaker, yep. or each speaker. Yep. Maybe some were backups, but lovely to see and hear. Yep. Wonderful. Who's, who else is playing guitar in the Black Crows at the moment? Then? Is it Audley Freed? Oh, I don't know. I hope it is. Um, he would be amazing in that band. Well, he was in the Black Rose for a minute. I don't know who the other guitar player is. I'm assuming it's not Mark Ford. <laughs> Laurie Spryce's girl I work with thought Nirvana was a clothing brand. <laughs> yep. There's plenty of people wearing ACDC t-shirts the same. 
Do you have any ACDC jeans? <laughs> it would have meant a whole different thing 20 years ago, wouldn't it? Uh, well, that's good, Jason. I'm glad you got to see the Black Crows. I listen to the Black Crows weekly. My favourite albums are The Sudden Harmony and Musical Companion. Oh, wow. And I really, really love By Your Side. Oh, okay. Yeah, the way it starts off. One tab, two tab, three tab, four tab. All right, baby. Mm. I only know August and Everything After. That's Counting Crows. What are you talking about? Black Crows. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay, right, okay. Got it. <laughs> well... I went and saw, in that case... Recovering the Satellites is a better record than August, I think, as well, anyway. Um, uh, like, Paul Stacey mixed four of their albums. Paul Stacey... Black two, Crows. Black Crows. Yeah. Paul Stacey toured with the Black Crows for a couple of years. That, Les Paul, has been on tour with the Black Crows. There we are. If I had a mic, I'd drop it down. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Um, oh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to hurry up. Swizz eight seven one. Again, hi Swizz. He says, does a speaker react to a clean a clean amp channel with OD pedals? The same as it does with a dirty channel and no pedals. Is it essentially the same thing? No. Uh, I don't understand the question. Uh, right, you got clean channel. Yes. With pedal. Yes. Dirty channel, no pedal. Right. Is does the speaker go? This is the same thing. Speaker's just reacting to the voltage it's fed. So, yeah. Because now, if 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 the assumption in the premise here is that the EQ characteristics are the same, the transient response of the signal is the same, then yes, mm -hmm. but it won't be. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's the, that's the thing. We're very interested, setting up for filming tomorrow, we're, we're gonna do a show called Pedals for People Who Don't Like Pedals. So we crank the Marshall in Old school styley, and work back from there. Right. And we've been having all sorts of fun trying to get that amp at a point where it really works. But it's tricky. It's very tweaky. Re your point. Overdriving amp, pedal distortion. It, I mean, it's a very, very complex grey area, mm -hmm. is it not? So it really is. Yeah, um, so is it essentially the same thing? The speaker is reacting, the, the, it's, just a, it's just an AC voltage that's yeah. hammering the speaker, so it's, it's not receiving any different sort of voltage. And yeah, it's just, the speaker's just reacting. Yeah, it's all about what frequencies, how fast. Yeah. Is, is what it is. Yep. I think. Albus Band, Aaron, hello. Hey, says, Aaron. The beautiful Bunday. I'm actually home for a day as it's Labor Day. Happy Labor Day to everyone in the US. I thought it was Labor Day like not long ago. Isn't it? Don't is wear white after Labor Day or is that something else? Don't know. I think that's a, that's a fashion faux pas to wear white after Labor Day. Oh, yeah. Is there just one Labor Day in the US or does it happen multiple times a year? Anyway, Labor Day. Um, I love the Analog Friday video last Friday. Oh, cheers, bud. Just as I love you leg ends. Well, ah. thank you, Aaron. And enjoy your day of uh, hopefully rest and recuperation. Yes, mate. I had a, I had a fascinating conversation with Dan Coggins today ah, nice. about all things analog delay and chipsets and old Reticon chips and stuff. And it's just, we kicked out for a while. So wonderful. I think Dan should do a podcast with notable humans down the years. I would love to. I think it would be really good. It's the kind of thing you want to do in video form, but actually getting those humans in one room, recording the video, going through all of that is just a pain in the ass. Whereas you could just talk to them on the phone or via video chat or something, and it would be easy and it would be quick and it would be fascinating. And I think it would suit podcast much better than it would okay. suit video. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. 
I'll do it. If you do one on notable humans who've done really cool things, but no one knows who they are, mm -hmm. very few people know who they are. Okay. I'll do one on talking to people about mental health. Done. Yes. There you go. That's how we'll revive the podcast. You heard it here first. Chris Smith. Hi from Folsom, California. Ah, Folsom Prison Blues. That's the only reason I know of Folsom. Mm -hmm. I hear the trainer coming. It's coming down around the bend. Yep. Ah, I see the sunshine. Since I don't know. know. <laughs> stuck in my Folsom. dad's favourite song, and if you hear my dad sing that some days on a good day, he sounds like Johnny Cash. True really? St true story. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, my 15-year-old daughter plays a Strat, and I got her a Friedman JJ Jr. amp. Oh. Uh, during soundcheck at his first gig, there was a loud squeal. Uh, tried another outlet and reseating the tubes, but that didn't work. Okay, so you're saying it continued to squeal loudly? Okay, I think I know. Yeah. You got So if you've got a Strat and you've got the gain turned up too high yeah, on that too. amplifier... You're going to get it's like a parasitic oscillation thing happening, and yeah. because the um, you've got to be really careful with that stuff. Just turn the front end gain down until the squeal goes away, and you're set. Uh, yeah, I remember. I've, I've I've heard that a number of times, but I remember being in a little club in uh, Cornwall, and this guy had a like obviously a vintage SG with really low wind pickups. Yeah plugged into this cranked Marshall was just saying, and I'm like, man, just please, 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 just turn the game down a little bit and it'll sound spectacular. Yeah, yeah. But you'll get that. It's just the, just that, um, yeah, that oscillation. So just turn the game down a bit, you'll be golden. Yeah, that's number one, turn the game down and just see if that stops it. Number two, um, it might be a bad tube. It, it, yeah. It could be a bad tube. So uh, one way to check that is swap V1 and V2, because um, V1's doing the majority of the work probably. Mm -hmm. Um, or indeed just get a new 12X7, which I'm assuming it is, and swap it out and just see. You can usually tell um, if it's a dodgy tube. If you get it to the point just before it's squealing and tap it very safely with something wooden, like yeah. a chopstick, um, then that will tell you if it's going to go squealy or not. Um, obviously, I haven't advised you to do that because you can kill yourself poking around inside um, tube amps, so indeed. don't do that at all. Go and buy a new tube, swap it out safely with the power off and um, see if that makes a difference. Todd, uh, Todd Roy says 130, 136 likes but 883 watching. Give Mick and Dan a thumbs up, people. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Todd. I really appreciate that. Uh, Chris comes back with, the amp was unusable. After the gig, it worked great at home. Are there common problems that arise when gigging with the tube amp that you anticipate? It was hot outside. Uh, so... If you so the, the difference is when you're at home and it sounds great when you get outside and you turn the amp up, it's a completely different gain structure. I bet if you go outside and turn it up and just turn the input gain down, you, you'll find the problem. Because you've got um, if the amp is quiet and you're at home, and you turn that input gain up. You know you're not going to get that feedback thing between the guitar and the amplifier, but when it's at volume, you will. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to work out if you replicated exactly the same settings at home. I mean, it, all kinds of things can be microphonically weird. Dan and I always have this slight semi-joke, which always turns out to be true. If we've got a problem just before we start filming and something's going wrong, what is it? A lead. It's always, always a, a cable. Lead. Always a cable. So just check that your cables are right. And it could be something as stupid as the cable's just not quite plugged in right. Yep. And I know that sounds too silly uh, even to say in some cases, but you'd be amazed at how many times it's a flipping cable. Yep. So check that. Start from first principles, process of elimination. Um, and I would suspect that Friedman, if you just bought the amp, Friedman's customer support is going to have some suggestions for you. Lean on them. Lean on them. They yep. don't want an unhappy customer. Totally. They will be only too happy to help you, I'm sure. Yeah. Daniel Krauss says, had squealing with my Victory 140. Turned out to be the reverb plugs being loose. Plug them back in. There you go. It's always a lead. Yep. It's always, always a lead. lead. 
That's really interesting. Uh, Shatman 2, happy Monday. Shatman 2, because I'm a Shatman. <laughs> what did I hear the other day? Uh, I was listening to something yesterday. Somebody doing a cover of Nothing Else Matters by Metal Liquor. Um, Chris Stapleton. Oh, wow. Doing a cover of Nothing Else Matters. I was listening to it going, God, this is a good song. And, and then I realised it was... Uh, no, it's really good. Awesome. I yeah, bet it yeah. was great. It was really good, actually. Um, anyway, um, Happy Monday says, uh, One of my amps is a vintage clone of a Tweed Basement stroke J45, okay. JTM45. I'm considering getting an amp with an effects loop for reverb. You said the 1959X doesn't have a great loop. What should I look for? Right. Again some relevant discoverages earlier today. I don't know about the 1959X. If it's the same as the 1987X, what I'm assuming that has is something called a post-phase inverter master volume. Yep. I think well, a th it doesn't have a master volume. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, the yeah. loop <laughs> is in a position, essentially what sounds like before Pre the, the ph phase inverter. inverter. Because we were putting a boost in the loop of that amp and it just gets more overdriven. So it's distorting the power stage. It very well will come after the preamp stage, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't then overdrive the power stage too much to be really useful. Yeah. If that's the case with the reverb, you might be all right. So, because you're not trying to boost anything. So that the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the um, preamp is overdriving everything and this is, you know, using loops is just basic gain staging, right? It's no different than having pedals on your board. It's just think of the overdrive in the front of your amp as another overdrive pedal. Mm -hmm. If you then stick the reverb after the preamp of your amp, which is where most amp effects loops are, it should be fine. Where it's not going to be fine, and this is basic gain staging theory, is if the power stage after that is also overdriving. Because then what you get is reverb before overdrive, and we know that is a really fantastic sound, but it's not the sound you want. Mm -hmm. It's the shoegaze sound, right? Because the reverb just goes like a flipping volcano on all the um, overdrive. So it depends how you've got that amp set. If it's cranked and the power section is overdriving a lot, and the reverb happens to be before the phase splitter, or the loop is before the phase splitter, or the loop is driving the power section to the point of overdrive, mm. any combination of the above, then it will sound dirty and not very nice. It's probably unlikely in this day and age that you're going to be doing that with a 1959X. Yeah. It is a phenomenally, colossally loud amp, and I would have thought the loop in it is probably all right. Mm. That one, you can true... You can hard bypass it and you can set the level higher or lower. So um, most modern reverb pedals, I think it's fair to say, Dan, handle line level, no problem. Yes. It's really only old school analog stuff that really that really doesn't. Yeah. Not not universally, but as a general rule. Yeah. So your modern whatever it is going to be reverb pedal wise is probably going to be yeah, totally yeah. fine in a yeah, line level sure. loop. Not that many amps have line level loops these days. Yep. Paul um, Leonard Ewing says, I have 72 pedals on my board. If I have a problem, it's one of 73 cables. <laughs> Indeed. And we rather suspect you do from time to time. Joshua Chen, Josh, I have been meaning to send you an email for some time now. You said, Josh uh, is an Australian. Ergo, legend. And Josh sent us a record that he did, born of pure passion. Oh, wow with his mates, live. Awesome. Playing blues. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you some context here. I worked on a magazine where every record company, artist, whoever, sent us their new record when it was released. I had a room full of new music. All right. And I had to listen to most of it. All right. And there came a point where I never wanted to listen to another new blues record again as long as I lived. Sure. 
because you could write a blue song about that. I was like, na, 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 na. Albert King has I already send done this. Album. <laughs> na, 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 na. I gotta listen to it. Yeah, na, 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 and then, it's my problem, right? It's not anyone else's problem. But I felt that some of the output was perhaps not worth outputting. Sure. If I'm going to be honest about it, Josh, your album is an amazing piece of work. Congratulations. I told you it was a legend. Flipping hell, man. And I, I promise you, I've been, I've been meaning to send you an email. I mean, you don't need us to tell you it's good. You know it's good because you did it. I must play it to you. OK. Great sound, great playing, passion, feel, all of the above. Congratulations. Awesome. Well done. And he also sent a bunch of pictures of his Cuda Caster. Oh, cool. That he's put together. And it's obviously the whole project and everything is this labour of love and passion, Josh. And it just, it chimes so, it actually, it, 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 it arrived with me at a time where motivation was pretty low and I, it was a real shot in the arm. So thanks for taking the trouble to um, to send that in. It was a, wow. It's a big deal. Anyway, well there you done, go. mate. I've, I've, that's killer. I've sent you the email publicly, so I hope that's okay. Anyway, his question is, hi from Queensland. Queenslander! <laughs> If you got to play one pro gig, any style or band, but using a Les Paul SG Junior or Esquire, and one amp of any type or size with no pedals, what amp would you pick? And what? And I'm going to add, what guitar would it be out of all of those as well? So Josh is saying you get one guitar, one amp, and it has to be a single pickup guitar, either a Junior style or an Esquire. Any um, gig. Okay. Well, I see, I, I came really close actually to already have done that, but I had a big massive pedal board. <laughs> um, playing my SG Junior, uh, Tim Spirits, actually one of the best gigs we ever did was supporting Marillion uh, on one of their weekends away, a few thousand people okay. in this tent and we, um, yeah, me and Dave Gregory with our juniors. That is cool. Yeah, so Junior and Matchless together. It's just the most glorious And what would the gig be? Noise. What would the gig be? <sighs> Some outdoor festival where you can where things are loud. Um, probably Prog in the Park. There we go. Patience. It's coming. It's coming. We've got another meat feast tonight, if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Oh, I'm still working that job crazy through. Okay. Uh, I would go... Well, of my own guitars, obviously, I would go with my... Um... Oh, actually, this is tough, right? It is tough. So my first answer is I'd go with my uh, Collings 290 uh, DCS, which is an astonishing guitar. I would choose an amp that had reverb and trem in it. Oh, that's cool. So either a Princeton or a Deluxe Reverb, probably a Princeton E cranked, or the Deluxe Reverb cranked, depending on how the loud gig was. And I'd be playing with somebody like Aoife O'Donovan or Sarah Jarose. And I'd be doing Anthony da Costa's job. Right. I want to play with... Yeah, okay. In an in yeah, yeah. um, Americana situation. That's number one. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, I would improve my slide playing significantly and I would use my Supro, James Port, into a go. projector amp being schooled by Blake Mills and Joey nice. Landreth in some sort of alt Americana sci-fi movie weirdness with tape decks and record decks and all of that. I would change my answer. Yeah. I will take my junior into the Princeton with a Celestian Gold in it, cranked in the um, the Robert Randolph family family band <laughs> <laughs> with my guitar turned off, and I'm just stand there, clap, clap my hands. Yeah, and just listen That's to it. Robert play and just listen to him play. <laughs> there you go. Just, you're just going to look. That's, I'm, I'm just going. I'm, I'm cool. standing with the guitar and going. Yeah. You Sarah the man. <laughs> Excellent question, Josh. Thanks for that. Well done, mate. Uh, Joe Guinan. Hi, Joe. Um, he says, my first love show. Thank you. Uh, I made it. Oh, my first live show. It was a typo. <laughs> <laughs> it 
we thought we were your first love and it's actually your first live show, which is just as good. In fact, it's better. It's better. Um, oh, that is funny. He says, uh, I've been a follower since the gig rig days. I got to meet Dan at the Birmingham Guitar Show. I can only apologise. He says, I missed Mick, which is probably a bit of luck for you on that day. Um, a very big thank you. You are my daily driving buddies. Keep it up. Thanks, oh, Joe. Oh, mate. Yeah. How lovely. Thank I you. I think we remember. Did you have a... Did, uh, if, did you maybe have a camouflage guitar? If I remember correctly. I met someone that day with a camouflage guitar, but okay. you said you didn't meet me, so maybe it wasn't you. It might have been camouflage guitar, but I couldn't see it. <laughs> Sean Jones. Hi, Sean. Mick, you talked about the Oracle having that thing. Uh, the Oracle being the so Mythos Oracle analog delay uh, from the show on Friday. Can you Has just... that come back saying he's found a way to do that with the time? No, he sent me a, an email going, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for including the Oracle on the show. So maybe we should go back to him with that. that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Dan did manual modulation by turning the delay time up and down ever so slightly using his hands. And suggested if there's a way of doing that using control voltages in the Oracle, it would be really, really brilliant. Totally. Because, of course, what's nice with control voltages, it keeps it analog. Sean Jones, Mick, you talked about the Oracle having that thing. Can you distill down what features or properties you think create the magic? Yes, I can. Um, it's, number one, that the signal path remains analog. So there's no d or d uh, digital to analog and analog to digital processing going on, which creates latency and a bunch of other problems. Um, and you then require filtering for power section and stuff like that. So it's basically just, it's all of it, mm -hmm. everything. Here you are. Potentially at odds with that is then what the delay does in the way it filters the sound. Yes. So naturally those old bucket br brigade delay uh, chips or the bucket brigade chips which do the delay have a very well I guess random although it's not random once they're in the circuit but they they have a non-linear way in which they reproduce the sound and you lose a bit of top end you lose a bit of bottom end you lose fidelity as it goes and it's that loss of fidelity and the way in which the delay can sit under and provide this sort of supporting what was it you said Somebody said halo. Andy Timmons. The halo effect. Yeah. Mm. Well, the halo sits above, but it's the same thing. It's like this enveloping quality around it, which doesn't stomp over everything you're trying to play, but mm. nevertheless gives you this lovely cushion. Mm. Um, continue the analogy. Cushion, padded cell, <laughs> um, to bounce off. Um, and enjoy greatly. And, and for me, it's that. And... I, to explain that further, if you've ever bought a delay pedal and you've turned it on and you've gone, wow, God, that's just completely crashing over everything I'm trying to play. Mm. I just don't get it, which is definitely my first experience with delay. The, the discovery of analog delay is, well, actually, no, all the things that it does really badly, fidelity, <laughs> yep, noise, is exactly what you need for it to sit underneath. So that's how I would describe it Dan taught me all of that or at least led me down the path of discovering all of that and I found it first in the Analog Man ARDX20 mm. oh, so magic that and thing. then all the things you've introduced me to since so all those classic old analog delays so, so part of the conversation I had with Dan today and we're talking about that and you know these old chips and uh, you know but, but we're talking about how people filter them and voice them and you know what a lot of guys would do is they would EQ it with a whole bunch of top end going into the delay. Huh. And then that filter at the top end out, but with that filter, to, to bring it back to as close to Unity as I can, but with that filter, that would reduce the noise. Yes. Right? So you bring it down the top end to bring it back down to where it was. Yeah, right. But they're, they're getting rid of the noise. Yeah. But of course, if you think where that filter's happening and then you get the regeneration, you get that filter, 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 filter. So it goes off. Yeah. Huh. Look, it, and it's fascinating because that stuff wasn't invented for guitar. You know, it was invented to, like, stop um, noise stuff happening on telecoms equipment. Yeah, right. You know? It's like everything. So, like everything on. else. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, it was fascinating. <laughs> I, I had to let Dan go eventually. But seriously, I could sit on the phone with that guy for hours. Well, there's, there's Just fascinating. Pod podcast number four then. There we go. Um yeah, so that's how that's how I would describe it. And there's certain 
digital delays in which you can do it. So the Future Factory and the um, the other Free the Tone delay do it very very well indeed. Flight time, um, and I guess on you know more modern stuff like Boss DD two hundred, mm. DD five hundred timeline. Uh, Source Audio Collider, um, Delay Station by, or Echo System by, all the really great delays that we like. You can do it to a, to a degree, and some of them some of them do it exceptionally well, where you just filter off, you know, the repeat sits out of the way and mm. it gets worse as mm. it repeats. You can do that digitally, but, you know, n still nothing nothing sounds and reacts like a really great analog delay. And then you stumble into all the other problems with analog delays. They're really fussy about how hard you hit them. They're yep. really fussy about what comes after them. So yep. it's like, as always, there's no magic bullet, is no, there? Is no. that the right phrase? Um, anyway, George Radcliffe. Uh, George says, couldn't be happy with my Harmonious Monk from the TPS store. Oh, thank you, buddy. Thank you so much, George. Um, if any of you have been waiting for monks, we do have more in, so if you want to buy one, go ahead. Um, I love the way the subtle harmonic, harmonic trem from the monk adds a whole new dimension of movement when placed before my camouflage. Well done, Mick Dan and Jam Pedals. I, I use mine like that. That's very, very cool. It's a... Yeah. We love it. Yeah, we do. It's, you know, it's ours, so we uh, <laughs> are likely to be enthusiastic about it, but I genuinely love it. I lent, uh, I get well, gave one to Ainsley Lister, actually, who um, has become a really good friend, and I've been helping him expand his board a bit, and uh, went to a gig of his over lockdown, uh, oh, sorry, over the, my vacation, felt like lockdown, um, and uh, just watched him turning it on more and more frequently. Very heartening moment. It's a cool thing. George, thanks so much for buying one. Um, it's a big deal to us. It's a, it really does help what we do. Brian Carpenter. Hello, Brian. Hi, Brian. He says, hello, DNM from Michigan. When EQing an amp, but playing both a Strat and a Tele, how often do you adjust the EQ levels to accommodate the guitar? Um, it's been a while since I've done a Strat and Tele gig. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have for a long time, have you? No, not for a long time. So the nearest thing we can get to that is TPS every week, where at, at least at some point Dan's playing a Tele and I'm playing a Strat and we play them into the same amps and we don't make any adjustments. And the reason we don't do that is because we have the amp set the way we tend to set our amps is at the point of kind of most openness. Mm -hmm. So it's as balanced as it can be, give or take, and then whatever you put into it is going to respond in the way you want. It does sound a bit utopian and it do, it's not always possible. It's slightly weird because you might think that on a, on a, with a telly, for example, you need to turn the treble down. And if you've got a really clean, high headroom sound, that might be the case. Dan's the opposite. Dan tends to run the amp a bit more on the edge than I do, with more treble. Because what happens when you hit a strong signal into more treble? Well, if, if, if you have got headroom in the amplifier and you've got more treble, it can, get, it can go, ah. But if you've got, if the amplifier is limiting and then you hit it with the treble, what happens is, it's those frequencies that compress and bloom, so it doesn't get all spiky. Just they they become all chewy and lovely and focused. And it's that thing where you plug into an AC30 and you have the volume control there, and you're like, "Who on earth would ever crank this up?" Yeah. You crank it up, and you're like, "Ha ha." Yeah, yeah. It doesn't lovely. get any louder. It's just like, oh, yeah. or it's it's. The volume control on an AC30, it should be called volume from there to about there, yeah. and the rest should just be limiting. Tone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tone. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, that, and that's it. So uh, Dan will overdrive the trebles a bit harder. So EQ-wise, he'll run more EQ generally in the amp, more treble, um, because it's overdriving and because it sounds really nice. And I'll do that as well. Like if, if 
if the amp is on the edge, then I'll run all the EQ a bit higher. In fact, my favorite way to run a two rock is with the EQ switched out. Yeah. So it's just full open. When you're playing with a clean sound, when you're trying to balance up pedals, for sure, you might find the telly's a bit spiky. Conversely, you might find the Strat is spiky because it's not driving those trebles. Mm. So it's it really depends on the individual guitar. Yep. Um, but se setting the amplifier up so that it's it's working. What I find is if you've got if you've got headroom to the point where it's just uh, there's no limiting at all. It's just all dynamic. Just louder. It's just so what you'll do is you get these crazy transients from the bridge of the of the telly. You get the, the strap will seem half the volume. However, get the amplifier sitting on that point yeah. where it's working. It's still clean, but it's like you dig into it a little bit. Then what happens is the bridge pickup of the telly is going to give you an edge and bite, but it's not going to be overly harsh. Yeah. You're going to stick on the neck pickup of the strap. It's going to bloom and be lovely, but they'll they'll sort of be in the same ballpark. Actually, that's really... <laughs> if you think about... If you've been used to playing one style of guitar for years and years and years and you suddenly go, oh, what I need is a this. I did it with Les Paul first. And lo and behold, first gig with a Les Paul, I'm like, wow, this doesn't sound like my Strat at all. What do I have to do to this Les Paul to make it sound more like my Strat? <laughs> go through 20 years of that and then you pop out the other end going, hmm, maybe I should be using this Les Paul to sound like a Les Paul. Totally. <laughs> and so that it doesn't sound like the Strat. And that's like the forehead slapping moment where you go, it is ludicrous to pick up the guitar and try and make it, to try and make them all sort of sound the same. So one night you might want to play the Les Paul, the next night you want to might play the Strat and you want them to react the same. I could say all sorts of nasty things about Kempers if you want to do that. But actually the great release in it is have a telly, a Strat and a Les Paul and go, wow, when I pick up the telly, it's Keith and it does have the extended trebles yeah. and it does have the bite and it does have all of that. And like there are, there are parts of it where I go, Oh, really? And I, yeah, I'm, I don't know if we've all got the, the luxury of doing that these days, but, um, that's how I would do it. Get the amp on the, at its most open on all the controls and let the guitar be the guitar. Mm -hmm. Totally. It is a bit utopian, but try it. Yep. Yeah. Yep, totally. Sorry, we're going really slow. Jason Carapazzi, nice hey, to hear Jason. from you, Jason. He says, it's been a long time. I started a job earlier this year that zapped my free time to play guitar. It's frustrating. Have you ever gone long periods where you just couldn't play and how do you cope? Ah, oh, that is really interesting. Um... <sighs> no. What I would do, if I'm really busy, I'll get up early. Yeah. And because I always feel better after I play. If I haven't played guitar for a couple of days, I might not necessarily be conscious of it, but I'm like, something's a bit off. Something's but I'll, a bit of miss. Yeah, yeah, but I'll get off. I'll get up early and just, even, for, even just for 20 minutes, a bit of green tea, just sit down and just let, you know, let the fingers do the talking, baby. Yeah. You know. Don't know what your um, domestic situation is, Jason. You know, I, I feel for people who, not feel for people. I, I understand. You know, if you've got like a family, a commute, a demanding job, or even not a demanding job, just one that takes up lots of hours. Um, I don't know. Your evenings are filled with bedtime stories and yeah, all the other things you need to do. I don't even have kids. You've I, got a demanding puppy though. <laughs> But even before the puppy, and, uh, you, you know, I find it hard to find time to play oh. the guitar. And part of that is a bit of a lie because I think it's very easy to come up with excuses that you don't have time. You always have time. It's just about priorities. And if you, if you are in a position where, I don't know what your domestic situation is, but if you do have, you know, less responsibility in your life mm. 
then there is time and you will be able to find some time somewhere mm. if you want to. And it is a very thin line between not having enough time and not wanting to find the time. That's the problem I have is the mm. latter. The other big thing, though, is, I mean, what are you listening to? What are you listening to that inspires you to want to get up and play guitar? Mm. And, you know, I find that if if I ever feel, because, you know, I, I, I do and try to play guitar every day, but I don't always feel that inspired. And if, I, if there's ever a point where I'm like, you know, feel like I'm going through the motions, I'll listen to something... Yeah, I'll put some classical music on. Yeah, you know, I'll put some. I'll put something that I would I haven't listened to in ages on. Um, I'll go on to YouTube and look at a uh, an old Danny Gatton video or anything that'll that just sparks me. Go, wow! Yeah, yeah. How how are they making that noise? Yeah. Um, and it makes me want to explore. Mm. You know, but. but we're sonic explorers, Mick. That's what we're doing. <laughs> we're, um, yeah. The other thing you could try is remove any of the barriers that stop you. So um, one might be you physically got to pick up the guitar, move your amp somewhere, plug it in. Uh, it doesn't sound like very much, but if it's, if it's in any way a hassle to do any of that, that would be a great excuse not to do it. So, I don't know, get some Boss Wazza air headphones and always have it so that the guitar is there, it's plugged in, charged, ready to go, and you can just pick it up at any time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just wander around the house doing the cooking with the <laughs> with the Wazza headphones on. I do that sometimes. I do most of the cooking in our house, so sometimes I'll just, well, in days gone by, I would just have the guitar on while I'm cooking. Yeah. And that would, you know, at least I'd have, I'd be in touch with the guitar for half an hour a day. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the test trio, sorry, someone, someone says that, got a G2 and, and they're having some teething issues. It'll be something really simple. Just email support. We'll go through it with you. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll check it once we finish this. But, uh, yeah, don't worry, mate. We'll, we'll get you sorted. Paul Matulovic. Hi, hey, Paul. Paul. He says, happy Labor Day from the US. Happy Labor Day. I have a cabinet question. Um, you hear a lot about cab material, but what difference, uh, what differences do construction methods make and what is their effect? Okay. It's a really good question. I was stunned when I first started exploring cabinets. A quick, a quick story. We had a, a young guy working for us, a guy, we, Handsome Dave, and he's also worked for Mick. Mm. Lovely guy. Has the best feel, just this, you know, kind of much like it's like he, Dave, introduced me to Dor Brummel. Right, there you mm. go. Just this beautiful Great feel. feel. Yeah. Um, and he had a two rock, an old two rock uh, amplifier, a jet, playing through this old two by 12. And it was a, it'll come to me in a minute because I can see the, see what it's called. Anyway. Oh, no. Sorry? Bruno. Bruno. An old Bruno 2x12 cab. And I said, that's great. What speakers are in that? He told me and said, okay. So I went and bought the jet. I got the same speakers, put them in a 2x12 that I had, and it was so far apart from the sound that Dave had. And I had it at work and got Dave to play it, you know, so because obviously, you know, I... I couldn't believe it. So I had to buy Dave's <laughs> two by twelve to put the speakers in, and it was like, and I couldn't believe the difference it, it makes. So, if you talk to any cab designer, and you know they talk about standing waves in the cab and and resonant frequencies and all that sort of stuff, it makes a massive, massive difference. And when you're talking about, if you talk to um, uh, our very good friend Tom Waterman from Universal Audio, when we were talking about uh, setting up a little studio and, you know, where should we put the dampening stuff, we told Tom the what the room was made of and the, the dimensions. He came back with a textbook specifically written for our room about all that stuff and what the material... Not and... in his capacity for UA, by the no, way. No, no, just as, as, a, as, a, just mate. as a mate. Yeah, yeah. Because um, we've known Tom for, for years and years. And and it was... It's astounding the depth that you can go into on that stuff. Yeah. 
construction method, you know, it, it's all a part of it. Um, now, that's not to say that some cheap uh, particle board cabs aren't going to sound great, because, you know, some of them are. But th every now and then, there's a cab that, regardless of what you stick into it, yeah. It's just right. Yeah, so the key differences in construction, obviously the materials really do matter. So um, the, just how a, if you get two cabinets that are exactly the same, make one out of really sturdy ply and one out of really lightweight pine, as the original fender amps were, some of the reissues are, you know, the, the way that, that that material itself resonates is significant. Then comes what you do with the front and the back. So the baffle which holds the speakers, how much that moves and what it's made of, and whether the cabinet is open or closed. Both of those things make a colossal difference to how the cab sounds. And then whether the speakers are mounted behind the baffle yep, or, or in front, front of it. Yep. And that makes a huge difference as well. Totally. So all of a sudden, you know, maths alone says you've got all these variables. You've got four ways of doing that, times four ways of doing that, yep. times four ways of doing that. And each variable within those four ways is massive. So it's very difficult. I mean, there, there probably are things you could say about a stiff baffle yep. and a more flexible one. Yep. And then, of course, is it stiff that way or is it stiff that way? Yep. And where is it fixed in the thing? Yep. Uh, whether the speakers, like I said, are at the back of the baffle or at the front makes a big difference. So they do make a colossal difference. And whenever you, you know, watching Mesa Boogie build cabs, it's like, wow, you you really do yeah, think yeah, about yeah. this, don't you? It's not go just a check box. Out, go and check out the bare-faced cabs demo to see what a construction difference can make. But then the irony about that is how much do you think you, they thought about that when they put that together? Right. Yeah. So when when if the legend is true and all the players decided they wanted more speakers and it may, it may or may not have been Pete Townsend and Jim Marshall said, yeah, that's all right, we can put eight 12-inch speakers in this box... And Pete, I'm paraphrasing, said, sod that, it's way too heavy, can you cut it in half? Right. Which I assume, which I am told is how the 4x12 cab was born. You know, were they were they modelling that? Were they doing their... You know, yeah, their getting the maths out and saying, physics. hang on, Pete, let me just carry the one... The, the men in white coats say yeah. it needs to be made out of... But so, man, rock and roll is built on happy accidents. Yeah. All of music is built on happy accidents. Yeah. My life is one very happy accident. <laughs> so yeah, it does make a massive difference. Yeah. Uh, colossal, colossal difference. Whether you can compute that into something that's going to help you buy a cabinet is another is another matter. You can look. You can lose yourself down that rabbit hole. Yeah. The thing is, try some stuff out. You'll find some stuff that you really like. Stuff that's like, yeah, maybe not so much. Mm. I've got that Bruno cab, my Marshall 2x12 cab. Mm. Um, all the cabs we tried with the matchless, till the matchless cab came along, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. But the we tried so the, hard not to buy the matchless cab, didn't we? We did, but in the end, it's like, just got to be done. But that man, that using Ketner 2x12 with the greenbacks in it, oh, fab sounding thing. Oh, magic! I've got a slightly insane 4x12 on the way. You Clo do. I close bottom, wait to hear that. open top. It's going to have. Four Jensen um, Raptor, I think they are speakers, can't quite remember the name of them, in it. And uh, that's going to be a bonkers cab. Literally no idea if it's going to sound any good. Mm -hmm. Jolly Willard. Hello, Jolly. The Sir Discovery has me gassing. I use a classic Boss DM2, mostly mm -hmm. always on. Mm -hmm. You have to manage the clipping. Mm -hmm. Yes, you yes, do. Yes, you do. Read what I was saying earlier about all the problems of analogue delays. Yep. Especially if the delay is before overdrive. How did you find the Sir for headroom flexibility? So, really good, to the point where it will work in the effects loop of an amplifier. Yeah, probably what we liked about it most. Yeah, yeah. Anything. It's an, a, an analogue delay, voiced right, is a magical thing. But one of the things is, you know, I've got varying amounts of signal that I'll put into it, and it's always tricky... The Sir, because of the, the way it's designed and the headroom, is one of my favourite things about it, actually. You know, sounds great, um, but it just works with everything. Really, really great piece of gear. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, 
All things weatherly, I just got a full drive two MOSFET. Nice. I typically use an ODR Mini mm -hmm. in front of it. So Noble's ODR Mini, full drive two MOSFET mm -hmm. and a Pigtronics fat drive after. I'm looking for a good clean boost for solos. Well, there's a number of them. Uh, check out the Hampstead um, Ascent. Yep. It's like 36 dB of just pure... Of crazy. It's, you know, so if that's what you want, just more, Yeah. awesome. Um, if what you... I mean... Depends on your amp set yeah. and what it is. So let's assume it's a clean platform. Yep. Would you still go with the Ascent? If all I wanted was exactly the same sound, but more, yes. Generally speaking, though, that's not what I'm after. No. I'm after a bit of shaping. And yeah. in that sense, just a simple EQ pedal. Yeah. Like one of the shows we're doing tomorrow, we've got the um, MXR 10 band EQ out. Man alive, it sounds just great. Yeah. It's so flexible. It's just got those key frequencies in and tighten up the bottom end a little bit, hit the clon frequency. Or <laughs> hit the chief screamer frequency. Yeah, you know it's that's like, what I wow. was going to suggest. The nice EQ is as good at anything at doing it because you can shape it how you want. Yeah, you might not think you want to shape it that much, but once you start shaping it, you'll be like, ah, because right here's the thing: audibility for solos is about being louder, mm. right? It mm. just is. But it's not necessarily about being uniformly louder across all frequencies. Yep. Totally. And one of the problems with volume is, as you turn up, you're turning all the frequencies up. And there is great benefit from going, well, actually, I don't want to turn all those frequencies up. I just want to turn these ones up a bit and those ones up a little. These ones up a lot, those ones up not too much. And the sort of audible loudness of what you're doing might not seem that much more and yet it's perfectly audible for a solo because it sits in the mix better and that is a very complex way of explaining i apologize why an eq might be a better choice than a straight boost pedal certainly something to consider yeah yeah if you don't want the change in tone that you will get with a boost pedal other than that we would always say go for a clon <laughs> type pedal because that does the job it rolls off a bit of bottom gives you a boost where you need it 1k and then up from there and it's just a very nice thing so yep. a clon type yep yeah great yeah good luck yes indeed uh bovine aside bovine aside bovine side bovine aside i'd be worried if i was a bovine now that the hm2 wazza is out is there an incoming David Gilmore Tones episode? I think Prince used it too. We don't have one. Um, I really loved... Um, uh, CS Guitars video on the Colin. HM2. Colin. Oh, he did one, did he? He did one and it was fantastic. I, I really like Colin's videos. Yeah, yeah. He's so... I mean, he's a, like, physics degree holder guy yeah really so clever he does detail he re like uh, yeah but his videos like have, take, have done a step change as well. <laughs> awesome i think all scots people should cost, toss a caber at some point i had to eat haggis when i went to um edinburgh just because it's edinburgh and it's haggis yeah, yeah. i loved it, it it's was nice great. good stuff yeah, really yeah good stuff anyway um go and check out cs guitars uh hm2 show Absolutely fascinating. Um, I would love to play one. I had one as a kid. I couldn't get a sound out of it. Um, I don't know what we would what we would possibly have to offer that. Panel. Yeah, no, no is the answer. We we we're not really into sound alike videos. A primarily because we're not very good at them, and B we don't really want to sound like anybody. I think we're past sounding trying to sound like people I've tried because failed. it's a, such a futile experiment um well, i am more interested in the fact that that gilmore used it and that he used the big muff and yet when i listen to his guitar tones it doesn't sound anything like either of those pedals 
putting so, your cue before and after them and, and uh, so speak to your heart's content. That's, that's an happen. interesting question. Yeah, totally. Um, that's an interesting question. That might be the more interesting question to me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, Matt Tucker. Hi, Matt. He says, gents, I'm off on a nine month trip. Only able to take one guitar and no amp. I wondered, if you had this choice, would you pick an acoustic or an electric direct into a laptop or something like the Fender Micro? I'm going acoustic. I'm going electric. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because if you can take a laptop and an interface with you, you'd be stunned what you can do in nine months. Um, you know, most mornings I get my the little Boss Wazza Air things out and have Schwang while everyone's still asleep. And I find it so inspiring. Um, acoustics are great. Acoustics can be tricky to travel with, though, because of the way if you're traveling through different climates and different, uh, you know, noise heat you zones. And, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, there's a couple of things to consider. I just find that traveling, and you know, I've been lucky enough to, to travel a bit with guitars and stuff, and I just find that the... Um, especially tellies because they're such solid guitars, I just have no problem going anywhere with them and get mm. there and it's all good. Yeah. I think if I was going to be static somewhere, you know, if you're going somewhere, if you're going to Germany for nine months. Take an acoustic. Um, I don't, well, it depends, doesn't it? Because sometimes an acoustic is just too loud for yeah. the environment you're playing in. Yep. So I would, I would be... One thing that playing an acoustic for nine months and no electric will do is pretty much make your electric plane suck when you get back. Dude, the issue that I had when I stopped doing um, uh, cover gigs and the bit, you know, with the... Um, bipolar Bears? The Bipolar Bull. Yeah, the High Fidels. And the Bipolar Bears was the duo. So stopped doing High Fidels and then Doug and I were doing the Bipolar Bears, like that was the, the main gig. It was the worst, apart from not gigging at all, it was the worst thing for my playing ever <laughs> because I was just, you know, you, you, you're, you're playing chords and just, you know, doing the acoustic thing. The electric sits on you so differently and you go to do it, it's like, oh, it's so weird. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I thought it would help. It really didn't. Yeah. Yeah, so that may or may not be a consideration. Yeah. Um, well, Brian Garcia says... Um, David G used the HM2 for the Momentary Lapse album and the Delicate Sound of Thunder tour. He would push the HM2 into a muff with lower gain. HM2 for distortion and mid-range, muff for low end bigness. Interesting. Very interesting. I, I, and I reckon that was also surrounded by a bunch of EQ. I, yeah, well, we know it was because you've seen his pedal board. Yeah. Um, I could say all sorts of things about Pink Floyd that says would get 32 me says, probably yeah, sounds murdered. Ranted, though. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, I would take an Epiphone Casino. Nice. Very so can, nice. So you can do both. Yep, yeah, very nice. Uh, Bell Tunnel. I want to approximate the double harmonic trem things you did with Joey Landreth. Mm. Would two harmonious monks at the end of my chain work? Uh, you'd have to have them in parallel. Yeah. And, and then, preferably into separate amps. Yeah. But if you have one amplifier, you do them in parallel. That would work. That would be... <laughs> and how might somebody Killer. do something in parallel, Daniel? Well, you've got to split the signal, send them into the inputs, come out of the outputs, and then mix them. Yeah. There's a hundred different ways to do that. Yeah. Um, Josh Scott's got his uh, splitter and then summing amplifiers. You can do it like that. Uh, we make a thing called the wetter box. You can do it like that. Uh, there's a bunch of, bunch of things that you can do it with. Yeah. Um, the simplest way to do it, though... Um, is like the JHS splitter and then summer. Splitter. Splitter. And the reason you're doing that is because you don't want one pedal affecting the other pedal. One of the things that's so cool about the sound is that they're doing separate things. And then if you feed, you know, that, that wave into that wave, you're going to get a mm. c combination of those two waves. If you split them, you're not. The best thing, now, I don't know if this is open to you as an option, Bell, um, most of us have got the amp that we play, and that's our favourite amp. And most of us have still got the POS that we don't play anymore, 
or the last amp that we had, or indeed something else quite nice, we would thoroughly, thoroughly encourage you to try wet dry. Yeah. And you can watch many of our videos on that and split those two harmonic drums. It doesn't have to be two harmonious monks. It could be a harmonious monk and any other harmo harmonic trem. But yeah, two harmonious monks would be really killer. Um, and split them into two separate amps and just... It's just so massive. Be born anew at yep. the hail of a new but just, dawn. It's so interesting what happens when you just put, uh, when you split your the signal and you just put one into one amplifier, yep. you still get this movement, but, but having separate monks, different times into the different amplifiers, it's, it's amazing. And you can do the different time thing, but also try them the times just off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And you get this thing and that ends up just it's such a great oh, sound. Oh, man. Such it's, a great sound. Yeah, yeah. Really cool. Uh, I think you were about to say something. Were you done? Or... Um, You're right uh, off my head, Simon something? Park said, Mix Moans, the Pink Floyd edition. <laughs> yeah, so when you were talking, I said there's lots of things I could say about Pink Floyd that would probably get me murdered. Um, Mix Moans. Basically, I gave up after Dark Side of the Moon. Right. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll get to the Dark Side of the Moon. Let so if you could... If you could <laughs> if you could educate me um, thereafter, I would be interested. Yeah. I mean, the wall, maybe. Maybe the wall. In yeah. Part. In well, part. I thought the wall's, wall's amazing. Yeah. But you can tell that I don't really know much. Um, Connor Larkin, hello from Michigan. You both have some choice guitars. Mick, which of Dan's guitars is your favourite? And Dan, same question for you. Mine is Mick's 335. Mine is Dan's... 61 uh, Les Paul Jr. Easy. Very good. Um, Seattle Phil, I'm thinking of getting my first Strat in the next couple of months with a budget of 2 to 3K. I'm looking at Ultras, but I have a lot to learn about Strats. What are your initial tips or factors to think about? Did a whole show on Strats. Please watch it, Phil. And that will... It's so, if you're going to spend that sort of money, please watch the show. Because all those, there's no quick way. Because there's, there's no. I'm I was stunned because I'm not really a. I used to play strat years ago before it was stolen, but I don't really know a huge amounts about strats. And I was because I play a Telecaster, which is a relatively simple guitar. Strats, man, there's so much going on there. So please watch the show, Phil, and it will take you through everything. And I think what will also happen is you get a bit of a better idea of what you're looking for. Yeah. In a strat as well. That, that's the that's where you start, Phil. It's um. So a big part of it is going to be what guitar you're coming from. So if you're coming from a fairly refined, easy to play, powerful sort of guitar, and by that I might mean I don't know if you're into posh guitars like Sirs or Andersons or um, PRSs, uh, you know, like modern guitars that are easy to play and sound massive. Strat's going to be really really hard work for you. Mm. Um, but liberating at the same time. Jimmy James says that Strat episode was fantastic. Thank you. Mike. Thank you, yes. Jimmy. Uh, if you're coming from the world of a telly or a junior style guitar or something more vintage, then it will be a little bit easier transition for you. Um, the first decision to make is whether you want a more traditional type Strat or whether you want a modern Strat. And that you mentioned the Ultras is interesting. So there's a bunch of things about the Ultras that's pretty cool. And definitely, if you're coming from a more modern guitar, easier to play, mm. more powerful wall of that, the Ultra's going to appeal to you. I've got one in a box out there, actually, um, which I'm going to make a video on for various reasons. I will say controversially that it's not a Strat to me. A Strat is the spec that existed between 1954 and 1964. That is what Strat is. That's what? what, that's what and when did it not become a strat like post cbs well to be to be fair let, let's not put an end date on it because there's plenty of 70s strats that are, are really fantastic yeah, 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 yeah. 68 69 70 especially there's so many of those guitars are but just design are, are everything that i yep. would ever want a strat to be yeah and plenty i played plenty of 70s strats that are really really nice too so what i mean is by the time it goes to two point bridge yes okay modern style pickups yep. spread bodies uh, that are heavy, um, you know, uh, regular viewers will know I'm no fan of uh, modern finishes either. 
you know, that old Strat thing. And that's not to say that all old Strats were good because they really, really weren't. Mm. So my personal preference is for a Strat that's as close as possible to the old spec. Lots and lots of people really hate that for lots of reasons. One is, how curvy is the fingerboard? Right. Can you play a really curvy fingerboard with tiny frets? Do you want weak pickups? Do you want that trim that requires mm -hmm. a year's learning in order to be able to use it properly? Or do you want something that's easier, fuller sounding, easy to play, a trim that works, in which case the Ultra is a really good shout. We don't really go into that on that video that Dan just mentioned because we talk specifically about the kind of strats I like, which are the old school ones. They're more work, harder to live with if you don't come from that world. But for me, that is the strat. Sound for whatever the hell that means. Sure. Because <laughs> who have we got? Hendrix, Knopfler, Clapton, Gilmore, Jeff Beck. All sound phenomenally different. Yeah, yeah, totally. So we, I wish you luck on it. Um, yeah, yeah. But check out that video, and uh, I think you'll find that really helpful with this uh, journey. This, decision to make. The, so what am I, I'm going to be 48 years old in March, and that will be... I got my first Strat when I was 14. So I've been playing Strats for 34 years and I still am largely none the wiser. <laughs> so it just keeps, you know, dive in. Buy the one you like the colour of. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Good luck. Um, Shawnee is Cubs fan one. Shawnee is Cubs fan one. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. What Victory V4 pedal would be the best to pair with an RK50 for the most versatile sound? I'm a blues rock, hard rock player. Cheers from Chicago. Hmm. Interesting. Does the RK50 have an effects loop? <laughs> Series effects loop. Yeah, okay. Great. Um, so as you know, RK50, absolutely killer amp. I, I think it might be my favourite Victory amp. Really? Apart from the V140. Yeah. Uh, it would be my favourite rock Victory amp. Yeah. The rock tone, the, the, like the, I mean, to be the fair. The cleanup is amazing, right? Yeah, gorgeous. It's the V140 is my favourite overall. I've had to get yeah. one, it'd be that one. But yeah, that's... Um, off the volume control on that thing, magic. Really, really great sounding amp. Um, it's tough. Depends. So your uh, blues and blues rock and hard rock. It's. I don't know what else you'd want really. It could be that the Kraken would give you more contemporary hard rock tone. Uh, if that's what oh, you're looking for. Yeah, the Kraken's killer. And it might be. I don't know if they've done the. Have they done the VC35 copper one yet? That might give you sort of more hairy ass, mm. um, chewy, gritty, yeah. boxy type thing if you want that. Um, probably wouldn't bother with the Countess, which is now called the Jack, because uh, I liked that. You've got all of that in your RK50, right? Um, I'd probably, it, yeah, it depends which way you lean. Um, now, it might be that the Duchess could be a good shout mm. too if you mm. want cleaner tones. Because remember, when you use the V4 series, if you use it in the way that it sits in the effects loop, it cuts off the front end of your amp. So you, so you might find that if you want maybe some warmer, more classic 60s, type clean tones then the 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 countess could uh, sorry <laughs> feel folly yes the duchess could be the one to go for yeah. so if you lean more you know if you listen to rabia more than you listen to john mayer uh go for the kraken for the kraken mm. if you want cleaner crunchier sort of warmer clean tones go for the duchess lovely there you go Sorry, I can see Dan is literally dying, hoping that I can't hurry up. And that's all good. Um, you hungry? Yes. Um, we do have quite a lot to go. Okay. Um, 
Oh my god, we have a lot to go. <laughs> okay, let's bang them out. I think we do need to. Oh my god. <laughs> That's okay. Let's go. Let's go. I'm good. I just have a glass of water. Uh, music therapy, Laz. Gentlemen, this may be blasphemy, but I have yet to buy a flanger pedal. Option paralysis. Yeah, what do yeah, I buy? Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge Andy Summers fan. Okay, Andy Summers, you need an, an electric mistress. Look at the new electro harmonics offerings. They've got some fantastic, I mean, you know, they created the mistress. The guy that created the mistress still works at electro harmonics. So, yeah. Budget, right. budget version, Dan uses the Moore Elect Lady, which is no longer called the Elect Lady, I don't think, or it might be. Anyway, yeah. Moore Elect Lady, Dan has used that. And for uh, a, a less cheap option, the Thorpe Camouflage is the one that you would recommend, isn't it? I love that thing. It's so beautiful. Good luck. Bruz Tart or Bruise Art. <laughs> no tart at all. Bruise Art. Greetings from Belgium. Oh, greetings indeed. Oh, Bruss is going to be, isn't it? Bruss Art. Brussels. Bruss Art. Right. Bruce Art. I notice you've changed the mics you use on the cabs. What are they and do you still like the Sontronics? The sound on the analog, analog delay episode was amazing. Um, yeah, we do like the Sontronics Delta. Sontronics are lovely. We do wonder if ours need servicing because they seem to start sounding pretty dark. So I don't know if we've battered the... I mean, bear in mind, they get battered. Really week battered. in, week out, hammered. Yep. So I don't know if it's that. Um, I was finding that I was rolling on a bit more EQ than I would have liked. Uh, regular viewers will know that when I do the audio, we add a bit of 10K and we add a bit of 3.2K. 3.2K gives bite to distortions. 10K to 12K gives you what we would call air presence. Um, and that, and I was finding I was having to roll a bit too much of that on. So the even with the ribbon mics right on the center of the speaker. Now, we know that ribbon mics tend to be a bit warmer. That's mm -hmm. why they get used and why they're loved so much. Um, and then just for the halibut, uh, a friend of mine said, you should really try these Austrian Audio OC18s. I think you really like them. Background to that is they are somewhat similar to older AKG C414s, and we like the 414s. We use them as room mics. Anyway, I gave them a try, and um, it was like sort of taking a cloak off again, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really, 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 really like them and don't do hardly any EQ. Now, it's not that normal to use a large diaphragm capacitor microphone on a guitar cab. More commonly, would you would use dynamics and ribbons. For the what we need to do here at that pedal show, we want to ca capture as much of the sound of that amp as possible. And in that respect, a nice capacitor mic can work really good. We used to use Neumann TLM 102s because they were the only thing that could handle mm. the two rock when it was cranked. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just like them. I really like them. Very yeah. little uh, corrective EQ to do, and they they just seem to capture the sizzle and the high end in a way that we really like. Um, I think you like them, don't you? Love them. I think they sound beautiful. They work great. Mm -hmm. um, I have actually just acquired a pair of um, Meris preamps, analog preamps, which we're going to try. Cool. I want to get I want to get the signal chain as analog as possible as far as possible. Yeah, yeah. And I want to see because I still hear I still hear the digital mm. on stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know when you hear a great mic into a great analog console to tape, we're never going to get there unfortunately. Um, it's a different experience. It is. It is. Anyway, shall I hurry up, Dan? Um, or should I keep going? No, let's. Should I talk some more about that? Can we? <laughs> <laughs> I've been using the uh, Sontronics Orpheus for my vocal on this EP, and it's beautiful. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Mics yeah. are an interesting thing. Oh, they? I love microphones. Anyway, Austrian Audio OC18 is what we're using currently. Very nice. John Newquist. Hey, John. Hey, John. Uh, no questions, so I'll see if Bev has sent us one. Uh, meantime, Jeff Harper, will you be playing the purple telly anymore in some episodes? Um, I won't be. Uh, the Squire. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. It, that sounds 
great that guitar. It actually. does sound good. Um, it sound it sounded really really good in that video. Uh, okay, so no, not yet from John Newquist. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry to be so brief with that answer. Um, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. I don't really play tellies that much, and if I do, I want to play Myers Bell one. Yeah, Dan plays tellies a lot, and if he does, he wants to play his 65 or his red one, and that's pretty much all butters. That is. Yeah. Love butters. So the, the, those three, I mean, the squire's not going to get much of a look in in that company. Is I'm it? not going to have those three guitars and go. You know no. what? Today I feel like uh, yeah. purple, but doesn't mean it's not a great guitar. Maybe we could auction it for charity or something. I do have pangs of guilt. All these guitars sat here and none of them ever get played. It does. It, that is becoming a problem for me psychologically. It's so pretty though. Yeah. Um. Gabor Mata, hi DNM. Because of you and Josh Scott, I got into DIY pedal building. Nice. Good for you, Gabor or Gabor, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, I built my first Governor and a Friedman B E O D copy. Oh, wow. So thank you for being so inspiring. Next round of beer is on me. Well, thank you for that. Good uh, on you. Can, you can email us how you intend to supply us with that beer and we will uh, gladly receive it. Um, you know, Let's get your people to talk to our people. We'll get the ball rolling, and let's see if we can't get that uh, liquid refreshment happening. That'd be great. <laughs> He's already done it, mate. Legend. Thank, Thank you, you Gabor. Um, Thank you, Elena Stacy. Finally got a protein after hearing it on the sounds in the telly show. Says Elena. So good. Uh, thought on running a Tumnus Deluxe first, and using the EQ in the Tumnus Deluxe to play with the character of the breakup or other fun combinations. So I think the Tumblr Deluxe would work great after the protein. Um, the for me, it's got too much bottom end sticking it in the front. I think it, you you might want to get a bit woolly. Deluxe has got the EQ on it. Oh, the Deluxe has got the EQ on it. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, yes. Because the protein is interesting, right? You've got your your. Um, Nobles ODR1 ODR type. One and a Blues Breaker type. Now, both of those are quite fat yeah. pedals, right? They surprisingly, they stack well, surprisingly, yeah. stack well. The great thing about the Tumnus that if you can just bring the bottom end down a little bit, kicking into the front end of that will really sizzle those mids up, give it a bit of spark and clarity. Yeah. And I... Personally, for me, I love that stuff. It will also work equally well, though, after. Yeah. So try that. Try stuffing it into the front, boost the trebles. Bring the bass down in the bring, front. And just get it, like, Yeah. get everything really squashing yeah. and, and just hammer it and, I don't know, pretend you're Jack White or... Brian May. Yeah, for a minute. Excuse me. I <coughs> I heard I Want It All on the radio Yeah, and I want it day. now, yeah. Here's the the guitar playing in the opening of that song. It's like, oh man, it's perfect. It's so good. Awesome. Or stick it after and use it like a clon type boost exactly. where you roll off a bit of the bottom end. Yeah. And it just does that really lovely thing. Just lovely thing. Really good. I love it that way. Yeah. Anyway. Daniel Chavez. Hello, Daniel. Hey, he says, Daniel. I want an amp to pair with my VC35 Deluxe, which has Celestian Golds. Victory share of 44. I need to order some Celestian Golds. Or a Celestian Golds. Okay. Okay. An 801. Yeah, I need a 10-inch one and a 12-inch one. Okay. Um, Victory share of v share 44 or V40 Deluxe. Wet, dry, low, mid-gain, classic rock is the goal. I would go V40 Deluxe, personally. I think the Sheriff 44, wonderful martially beast that it is hand on heart I do not love it at low volume right yeah sure saying that though when I was I love it cranked yeah when I so was it the Sheriff 22 I was I was uh, when I first met Graham Coxon yeah. I was at his home studio and he had a sheriff. I think it was the sheriff twenty-two. He did. And he had it at the other end of his. He's got mm. all his stage clothes, right? His brass of stage clothes, and he had it in the center of that, it's right at the other end of the room. 
and he'd just pull the clothes all around it with a mic in it, <laughs> quaint, yeah. and that's how he records everything. It's so it was like, <laughs> mic on an amplifier, yeah. and he goes, you know, this is, this is, how, this is how, and then you, he plays it back and it's like, oh my goodness, you're amazing. Yeah. Um, records, a, anyway, just had to say that amplifier records beautifully. It is a tough choice. It's a tough choice. I personally would go V40 Deluxe, uh, partly because I love the tremolo in it, and partly because that's just more my thing. I think the your VC35 is doing the sizzle, upper high mids yeah. thing, and the Show 44 will do a lot of that as well. So I, I actually think... I mean, they're both going to work great. I think the V40 Deluxe for me. Yeah. Yeah, I can care. Uh, Andy Kay, welcome back, chaps. Do you have any tips or advice to improve singing while playing? I can do one or the other, but really struggle to multitask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Practice. Yeah. It's got, yeah, there's no easy way around it. No. I remember uh, watching Sting play this really syncopated bass line and just singing so effortlessly yeah, going, yeah. how do you do that? But then it's just, okay, I'm learning a song at the moment, a King Crimson song called Frame by Frame, right? Which you played all over Friday's video by all accounts. I played a little bit of it. I played a little bit of it. Interestingly, the reason Friday's video is late, just while Dan prepares his uh, performance here, um, <laughs> uh, is we uploaded the video and it gets stopped in checks. I played do 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 didn't even play that bit. I played do 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 of um Van Halen's Ain't Talking Change. About Love. Oh yeah, yeah. In the right key, but definitely not with the right sound. Right. Got flayed. Well no, it it got stuck in check. And it got stuck in check to the point where I didn't think it was ever going to come out of being stuck in check. So I re-edited the video, I took that one and a bit seconds out of the video. Mm -hmm. I then re-output and re-uploaded, which takes, I don't know, three or four hours maybe. It flew through checks. Yeah. But you can play King Crimson all day and get away with it. Because I play it so poorly, no one would ever <laughs> recognise it. I think that's what it is. <laughs> we know that Van Halen are pretty hot on their copyright. Yeah, I don't think yeah, it was yeah, that. Yeah. I actually think it was a software glitch, but... Yeah, right. But see, there's a, there's, the front, there's, a, there's a riff on, um, 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 uh, oh, man. Right? This is going all the way, and then you start sing the, uh, over top of that. Frame by frame. Da, 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 da. And, 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 and. That's quite impressive. Um, and you know, and I first heard that thinking, how on earth am I going to make that work? You just slow it right down. Just start. you get your you get your. I'm uh, thinking, okay, there's one, but there's the melody note. Um, and you just start, and then work out where it's hard, and you work extra hard on that bit. Uh, yeah. And there you go. There you go. Practice. Pr honestly. I'm trying to think of the, the ones that I really struggle with. One of the songs we, we did in the TPS band set, uh, Life in the Fast Lane. I cannot play that riff and sing Life in the Fast Lane. Life in the Fast Lane. Can't do that. Can sing Manic Depression all day long and play that, no problem. That's so interesting. Um, what else did Can we, we do some more gigs soon, please? What, el what else did we used to do? Um, I'll tell you, if you agree to do some more gigs soon, please. Uh, I'm going to ignore that, Dan. Come on, it's time. Yeah, we do need to do more gigs for sure. Poor Paddy's been sat out in his van now, outside there, for over a year, waiting for, us, waiting for the call. Been living on pot noodle. Sat in the van. Okay. Every now and then, knocking the door. Can call? we can we play again, guys? Please. Um, literally can't sing over that. But manic depression is such a muscle. Can do that all day. What? what um, Gotta 
good reason Take any easy way out Got a good reason So it's interesting, isn't it? Because you're not Take it easy It's when you're doing I guess what we're used to doing yeah. as, uh, people who are singers uh, and guitar players are used to playing chords. Yeah. So yeah, what we haven't even said is start with some chords. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and just, uh, yeah. Yeah. But when you can, when it comes to doing complicated, more complicated stuff, yeah. the only the only way to do it is start down and just work through it. Yeah. 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 I'm sure there's some cognitive process by way. The more you do it, the m then you attain some sort of muscle memory, and therefore it's this, isn't it? Your cognition is, yeah, it clicks into place. It becomes presumably the um, the physical equivalent of a of an acronym. Yeah, you know, BMW is three separate things, but it's one thing, isn't it? <laughs> It is. Well, it's three letters, right? The reason yeah, acronyms yeah. work is because they come, they become yeah, one thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's a single thing, not yeah, three yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that's how it works. Anyway, sorry. Oh, God. We're never going to finish, Dan. The meat feast may not happen. Don't say that. <laughs> Please don't say that. Apol with apologies to the uh, vegetarians. Um, and vegans. Um... Uh, oh god. Oh god. Uh, 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 uh. Yes, Andy, um, practice makes better, is what we all say. John Hatton. Hey, Leggins. Love the show. Thank you, John. Possible name for a random pedal game, a viewer suggested. <laughs> Who wants to be a Mjolnir? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Your your incredible generosity to us in making that gag is thoroughly, thoroughly appreciated. That so is you. fantastic. Paul Harmingson. Hello, Paul. Hey, Paul. Uh, Dan, I've got a question, and hello from the LA area. Can you explain how pedal order works in stomp box mode in G3? Is it tagged at the end of the chain, or can you define it? No, so it's defined in the preset. So you have to have a preset that you use in stomp box over. You define the pedal order in the preset. So, um, you know, if I've, uh, I, if I've got a preset, I define the pedal order. I don't necessarily have to have the pedal selected in that preset. Define the pedal order in the preset, and then when you select stomp box mode, it'll, it'll go in the order that the preset's programmed in. Yeah. I've actually just done a video on that. I've got a whole bunch of new G3 videos that are coming out uh, next week or so. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get some graphics together, but it explains all that stuff. But that's, yeah, it's all defined by the preset. Boom. So if I've understood that right, let's say you choose preset one. Yep. That is a preset. Yep. You then go into the menu. Yep. And you set up your pedal order as you want them. Yes. Then within preset one, you assign whatever you want in stomp box mode onto well, the switches. Well, the stomp box mode presets are set up separately to preset one, right? So let's say I've got my, in preset one, my chorus is in loop five and my flange is in loop seven, for example, right? And in preset one, I want my chorus to go after my flanger. In preset one, I go in there to loop order and I put my, uh, my flanger first, loop seven, and then I press loop five and that's the order. Then I, then I go to two stop box presets that I want to be my chorus and my flanger, right? And one stop box preset, I program that to be loop five. Another stop box preset, I program that to be loop seven. Now I hit preset number one, right? And at the moment, I don't have the chorus and flanger turned on. But when I hit the stop box presets to turn on those loops on top of that, uh, the normal preset, that's the order it turn, that it'll it'll put the flanger first and then the chorus. If we go to the second preset that doesn't have the the loops turned around like, like reordered, it'll put the chorus first and the flanger second. So yeah, I explained it. It's hard to do. I can I can. It makes perfect sense in my brain, but unless we're we're using graphics to show how it works, it's quite hard to explain. 
if you've got a G3 and you're working on it, you'll understand the difference between a presets, uh, a normal preset and a stomp box mode thing. It'll be it'll all make sense to you when I release the video. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. All will become clear. It will become clear. I get confused because I know presets and stomp box mode. I didn't know there were presets, stomp box presets. Well, no, the, well, you have a preset. Stomp box modes are separate to the presets. They work on top of the preset. Yes. Right. That I did understand. Right. So all I'm saying is. You define the loop order in the preset. If you go yeah. to a different preset with a different loop order, you, the stomp box modes all still work. Oh, I see. But the order that they're going is defined by the preset. So nice. you can have. But so what you can't do then is if your preset is one, yep. you can't have a pedal on stomp box mode on one. No. No. That's why I was misunderstanding. Exactly. Now exactly I understand. That. Exactly that. All is clear. Uh, Paul Mazulovich again. Hey, Paul. He hey, says, Paul. Have Yins heard about Joey's new album? Covering Lowell George. Yes, we have. We, we were it should privy to that wonderful information a while ago. I've been listening to it for a long time. Amazing. Actually, and it is an astounding piece of work. Some of the guitar tones on there, I had to send him a text and I'm like, have you like done loads of speeding up and slowing down of stuff? And he's like, nope. I'm like, okay, load of direct tones then, direct to desk. He's like, yep. Some it is an astonishing piece yeah, of work. Yeah, it, yeah really. You know, it's a labour of love. If you're not a Little Feet Lowell George fan, um, it may not make a lot of sense to you, in which case you need to go and listen to all those records. If you've listened to those records and then you listen to what Joey's done, you're it in for is a treat. Like, holy crap, what an amazing piece of work. Yep. So I don't know when he's, when he's going to bring it out, but um, he said, I found the Yawl incident too funny, so here's more PA slang for you, Pennsylvania, I guess. Uh, yins. Yins. Okay. As opposed to Yawl. I think in the South. Oh, really? In the South, they say. Hey, Yins. They say uh, Yawl. Okay. How are Yins doing? Yeah. I wish that means something completely different. Yeah. I've got it completely wrong. The Yins over here. Yang's, Yang's over, over there. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Punotted Bumhucker <laughs> says Dan, any plans on making a very simple pedal switcher for eight to ten pedals without the power supply and a lower price point? Love you guys. Uh, no plans as yet. I'm, I'm in the middle of six or seven different things at the moment, which is loads of fun. Uh, but yeah, I mean, no. But oh, you know, not, never say never. We'll see. Yeah, you um, presumably you know about the the QMX uh, loop switches, which are not pedal switches as such. Although they do have some basic functionality with a, something called flip-flop mode, which can give you some, it, it steps you towards a full loop switcher, but doesn't give you kind of, you know, turn, turn three pedals off and four yeah, pedals yeah. on. But that's certainly a good stepping stone if you want something simple. Corey Nichols, happy Monday, legends. Thank you, Corey. Legends. Uh, shout out to my best mate, an amazing guitarist, your boy Alan and his new blue Strat. I now have Strat Envy. So, uh, your boy, Alan, congrats on the new Strat. Corey has Envy. Thanks, Corey. Awesome. Chris Liddell or Lydell. Chris Liddell. Liddell or Lydell. I like the middle of Lydell. Sorry, Lydell's reminding me of something. It's not quite there yet. Mm. It'll come to it's me. It's where you can find the most amazing items. That aren't true. The, They're little. Middle of little. Middle of little. Lidl. Just the things they. I keep wanting to send you texts in there, but I've decided I'm just going to start buying things and bringing them in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he says, "Hi, DNM. Do either of you have any tips? Uh, have any tips about reducing fretting pressure? I tend to push too hard on strings." Oh man, I hear you. Especially hear slightly you. awkward chords and jumbo frets. So, right, jumbo frets. Nightmare. An absolute nightmare for that. And if you push too hard, trying to intonate on jumbo frets is the worst. I had red refretted with jumbo frets, had to take it back and get the the thinner, more vintage specs put in put in. Yeah. What I find is really tricky with fretting pressure is when things get loud. Yeah. And I start to go eh, because I'm rocking out and it's fun, and I start to hit that. I'm trying to get more out of the note, you know. Um, the great thing is that you're aware of it. 
And so if you're aware of it and you want to change it, you can deal with it. But it's, uh, you know, find someone who has got a touch that you really like and see if they'll show you how they do it and give you some things to try. Because um, it's a real discipline. Try some lighter strings. So you don't have to push them so hard. Yep. Or um, try some really, really heavy strings. Yeah. So, so change the string gauge. One of the benefits of lighter strings is you'll soon find out because you're pushing too hard. All those things he was just saying about intonation. But then pushing hard and the grip and all of that is part of the sound for a lot of people. Mm. Change your playing position. So if you find you sat down the whole time. If you're in the kitchen, go to the lounge room. Stand up. Try that. It's about changing something physical in the process which forces you to make a change that may be conscious or unconscious. So uh, string gauge change and change your playing position. See if that helps. Mm -hmm. And then maybe also um, actively try and put as little pressure on as possible and see what you can get away with yeah. as an exercise. Yep. I agree completely. I'm, this is my agree, agreeing. Listen to the tone change in gripping and gripping less. Yeah. And start using it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Gordon. Hi, Matthew. He says, guys, thanks for the knowledge and hangs. New single from the Delta Sound. Wake up. Streaming now. The Delta Sound. The Delta Sound. Wake up. Is streaming now. Peace. The Delta Sound. Wake up. What's the Rage Against the Machine? Wake up at the end of uh, Matrix. Oh. Yeah, very good. Um, still don't understand why anyone would want to be out of the Matrix. Still don't get that. <laughs> what they want to be out of it. Yeah. Still don't understand. Why, oh, why didn't I choose the blue pill? Why wouldn't you? <laughs> why do you want to be chased by like massive scary robots and like all that? Yeah. I just want, I, I just want the bliss of the peace. Adam Stewart, no, Sam Better Webster. Better stake in the Matrix as well. <laughs> Sam Webster, um, name one pedal each. Uh, electric Mistress. Uh, but there's more to it than that, Dan. There's mm. more to Electric Mistress than Electric Mistress. Electro Harmonic Electric Mistress. Filter, flanger. Filter Flanger Matrix. Filter Flanger Matrix. Yeah. Isn't that what it's called? Y yeah. There you go. Got there in the end. Okay. Have I lost this challenge? <laughs> no, it's just if you're going to name it, name it. Okay. Um, Ibanez TS808 Tube Screamer. Very good. There you go. Thanks, Sam. Adam Stewart, is that a Shine Super Fuzz over Dan's head? Know of anyone making fuzz whilst today? Unrelated. Future Factory is unreal. Thanks for the recommendation. No. Small, uh, there we go. Focus, focus, focus. There we go. Is that one? Uh, one there. And this one here. I'm looking down so it doesn't focus on my face. Surely there are people making fuzz wiles. Which is the the wah fuzz variation on this, which is the odd duo fuzz. I do have another duo fuzz where the label hasn't fallen off though. I'm not sure if it sounds as good as this one though. Uh, Fender Bender, was that a fuzz wah? No. Fender, the Fender Blender or the Fender The Fender Blender was the octave fuzz thing. Okay, so the answer is uh, Kai, no, Adam, 
Adam. Uh, yes, it is. But I don't think it's a Chine branded one, isn't it? So, uh, I'm sure this is Chine. But it might be, it, this might be a, a, an OEM version. Yeah, they were made under many. Oh, this is a Kimbara. Yeah. Sorry. They're, they're, they, they appeared under many, 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 many different brand names. Um, does anyone make one? Dunno, that would be a question for Mr. Google. I'm sure they do. Um, yeah. Uh, do you know of any, Dan? No. It's so interesting because it's it's basically the same circuit as the as the duo fuzz or or the you know that style circuit, um, and the wire in it's verge on unusable. They're so popular. It's really interesting. It's definitely the wire's definitely got its own sound, but it's quite unique. Yeah. Okay, there you go, Adam. Um, Kai Strawn says, welcome back. I'm looking for a tremolo. No, actually, doesn't say welcome back. He says, welcome back. Welcome um, I'm back. looking for a tremolo pedal, and I just saw that the Harmonious Monk is back in stock. Very enticing. Oh, good. I was also considering a Chase Bliss Gravitas, but how do these compare, and do you have any other recommendations? Uh, Gravitas is amazing. It's really flexible, Gravitas. It's the other one to try. Yeah. And if because if you want MIDI and programmability and all that sort of stuff, Gravitas is, is great. Yeah. Um, Harmonious Monk is a harmonic tremolo. I think you can get harmonic modes in the Gravitas you though. Um, but Harmonious Monk is very simple yeah. compared to that. You know, it's all it's all through whole components and handmade and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, it just depends on what you want. Like for me, that just gives me everything. I, you know. How many monk? I have it on that one setting, and it's just glorious. If you want loads of different settings from it, yeah, uh, yeah Gravitas is awesome. Yeah, I mean, you say trem. If you specifically want a harmonic trem, then I would say those are the two to 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 really look at. Yeah. Um, if you want just a regular tremolo pedal, there's plenty of choice out there. Yeah. Um, which you don't have to worry about the harmonic bit. Obviously, the reason we made the harmonious monk is because. Nothing else out there quite did it for us. Um, and working with Jam on it was an amazing opportunity. We think it's the best one out there, yeah. um, but we would leave it to you to decide that. Do watch demos of the Gravitas because it is a superb thing. Yeah. Superb thing with many more, many, 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 many more options. Yeah. That doesn't do harmonic. No, it doesn't, but you do. it's got two separate tremolo lines. That's the Stone Def Tremotron. Yeah. Really, really nice. Yeah. Um, and it goes super quick. You can get ring mold sounds out of it. Yeah. Sorry, Kai, that we, we can't be a bit more helpful. It's very difficult asking us to recommend other pedals over our signature pedal. We try and be as magnanimous about it as possible. We, we do. wouldn't we love make it. the Harmonious Monk if we didn't think it was the best thing available. Yeah. So um, that suits us. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's very hard to then. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're going to check out another one, definitely, definitely the Chase Bliss. Yep. Uh, personally, we would avoid anything digital that does the modulation digitally. Um, but again, that might work for you as well. Yep. So good luck. Hope you find something that really works. John Newquist. Hi, John. Nice to hear from you. He says, hello from Petaluma, home of Mesa Boogie, among other things. Nice. Uh, can you recommend some valve preamp pedals with low gain blackface voice that will warm up the power section of my JC40? Uh, yes, the Blackbird from Effectrode. Yeah. Really lovely. Um, Victory V40, the Duchess. The, yep, the Duchess pedal. V4, V4, V4. the Duchess, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Um, something from Simon Kingsley. So Simon Jarrett at Kingsley, he will make a version of the Maiden, and I think it's called the Maiden F. If that's bang on, then that's so impressive that you know that. It's very good. The Maiden comes as a D or an F. Okay. D for Dumble, F for Fender, I believe. That's worth a, really worth a good luck. We always love Simon's stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, might be a bit of a weight on it, but yeah, any of those three will do the job. Yep. Um, Tom Hurrell, 
Evening, Leggins. I play a Les Paul into a JTM30 and a Princeton. JTM30, you don't see too many of those about. It was a 3 by 10 wasn't it? One of them was. Really? I think so. Wow. Or maybe that was the 610. Mm. Um, a light speed handles the low gain, angry Charlie the high gain, but I can't find a medium drive pedal that really works. What are your ideas? So that you've got a light speed for the low gain, an angry Charlie... So uh, a blues breaker type thing for the yep. medium gain. Yep. I mean, King of Tone is, is the ultimate, but something like a Morning Glory... Uh, yep. is is a really good shout. Yep. Um, the Protein, wonderful medium gain tones in that. Uh, yeah, that would be my suggestion. Or, or, you know, even a Blues Driver. Boss Blues Driver. Uh, the Wazza version, absolutely killer. Yep. So oh, I think uh, with the pedals that you've got, though, that you like those, I think a Blues Bracket thing, uh, voicing-wise, will work really well. I think it will too. I'm just trying to see if there's any obvious that we've missed. Oh, the if you want a bit more mids in there though, something like the Gladio. Yeah, Gladio SC is a good shout. Yep. Really good shout. That's uh, lovely. Yeah. Um, Thorpey Gunshot. Thorpey Gunshot. I always want to mention Thorpey because everything Thorpey makes is blooming brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there you go. There's some suggestions for you, Tom. Um, Hope you enjoy that. Clonacaster. I like you already. He says, I just got news saying my lazy J10 will be sent this month. Oh, man. I can't wait. Where's Dan's J20? Can we have a Tweed special episode? Oh, playing please? it yesterday. Playing it yesterday at home. Je uh, Jesse is going to come on. We're going to do a Tweed show. We've got a whole bunch of things that we're organising with guests coming on. It's a little bit tricky to coordinate things at the moment, but uh, it is going to happen. I've been talking to Jesse about doing the show for ages. I love Jesse. He's great. I love his amps. Um, yeah, so it, it is going to happen. But yeah, my J20 is at home. I've been playing it yesterday. Just glorious. Um, it would be great to do a tweet show. It really would. It, yep. it really would. Um, Ed Bromiel. Hi, Ed. Hi, Ed. He says, hi, lads. I've recently got an Esquire reissue and I'm thinking of installing a neck pickup. Dan, have you ever tried the 50s wiring in a Telecaster? Yes. I hate it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It serves no practical purpose for me whatsoever. Why do you hate it? Because it's so... Mud. Just mud. The, so the 50s wiring in Telecaster where you've got the... If you've got a an Esquire, which is a single... The, just the bridge pickup. But you still have the switch on there. And what it does is you've got... Uh, it engages the one way the tone control is off, the next way the tone control is connected, and one way the tone control is basically all the way turned off. Um, and it's like just mud and dark, and yeah, I've found no use for it at all. Neck pickup in there, glorious. Context for that is Dan likes bright sounds. Yeah. Yeah, so there we are. Um, I've never tried it. I, I can see what they were going for. And, you know, some people make it work. I've never heard a sound from that thing. I thought, oh, yeah, that's great. Not for Just you. Just not for me. There you go. Sorry for the uh, slightly less than enthusiastic answer, Ed. Uh, Will Poynor says, hello from Hattiesburg. MS. When the smoke blowed out of Hattiesburg. I oh, know, Gettysburg. Um... That was a Steve Earle song, by the way. Well, just in case you thought your... it, it was him in the room. I thought you were doing your Tom Waits impression. No. Again. <laughs> um, that was the Alice record, just in case you don't have Alice by Tom Waits. And if you don't have Alice by Tom Waits, what the hell's wrong with you? Um, anyway, thoughts on the Demeter reverberator and used in front of a High Watt Custom 50. I've got a Monk recently and it is is ace thank you well thank you will for buying the monk that's a big deal to us and we're glad you like it demeter Re reverberator is a tr true spring reverb pedal that's got a long and a short tank in it yes and demeter make awesome awesome stuff yes they really do yes the only question you've got really is how you run the high watt in the front end because if you're going to use it gainy if you're going to be pushing the front end of that amp, 
and it's overdriving, then you're going to get the effect of reverb in front of overdrive, mm -hmm. which is a really cool sound, but it's not necessarily the sound everyone wants from reverb. You'd have to be running the high watt pretty hard. It's 50, not 100. Still. I know, I know. So, high watt 50. But if you're running it fairly clean and you just want a really nice reverb, it's going to be awesome. If you do run it gainy, then you're going to get into a bit of that massive splashy yeah huge you know knocking on the door of shoegaze mm -hmm. bloom that mm -hmm. you get when you run reverb before overdrive so just think about that otherwise killer jay manson says he chuckles every time he hears leg ends <laughs> there we are there you go. um the other way you could do it if uh, um are all 50 watt high watts for input no if it is for input, mm -hmm. you could try running it b through the jump of the channels. So we jump the channels on our high watt, i.e. you connect one channel to the other channel. You can put the reverb unit in between that. Might be worth a try. Mm -hmm. um, if, For example, if the normal channel is less gainy than the brilliant channel, it might be cleaner sounding. You all right, Dan? Good, mate. Good. I just hear... Baby, I hear the meat are calling. <laughs> meat salad and scrambled oh, meat. meat. Um, John Partridge. He says, hi, both. I got an Echo Fix tape echo to use live after watching your video. I've got a 15 watt Dr. Z amp. Okay. Do I need more headroom? How loud are you playing? Maybe not. Um, yeah, I mean, 15 watt Dr. Z is... That's loud. That's loud, yeah. I mean, it's very different from a 15 watt Line 6 Spider. <laughs> With all due Just respect to the Line 6 Spider. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a very different kind of 15 watts. Yeah. I mean, you know, try a, 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 a ladder amp with more headroom, but no, not necessarily. No. I think that'd be, for for everything but stadium gigs, that's perfect. I mean, you do, if you're running it into the front of the amp and it's overdriving too much, then you do. Yeah. But if you like the sound of it and it sounds it's great to your ears, then no, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. G. Barge, who's in Hawaii, I believe. Oh, yeah, he says, Good morning from Oahu. Oahu. Visiting my son. I just wanted to say cheers and happy you're back. Also, a shout out to Jusenberg and Andertons for their brilliant Book of Acts Session Man guitar. Oh, wow. Sounds and plays great uh, with a small setup. Aloha. Aloha, G. Aloha. Um, I didn't know they'd done that. No. So they've done a Jusenberg via Andertons with Tom Book of Act, have they? Doesn't surprise me. I'm not sure it's just a Tom Book of Act uh, model that Duesenberg are doing and they're selling in their millions. Great. Yeah. Good. I hope Tom is accepting a large royalty off yeah. that. Um, nice one, G. Good to hear from you. Hope you're well and enjoy Hawaii. Never been. Really want to go. Aloha. Yeah. Mahalo. Yeah, that's it. That's what I say. Right. Yeah. Um, did you know coconut can lower blood pressure? Oh, yeah. yeah. Coconut's amazing. I had no idea. Yeah. Not good if you've got low blood pressure, though. Not good if you've got low blood yeah. pressure. Okay. At all. Well, it's but it's it's coconut. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Robinson. He says hi both. I have strats with EMG mid boost, which really helps for certain pedals. For guitars without mid boost knob, I was thinking an EQ pedal could do a similar job. Any suggestions for a good EQ? Yeah, MSR 10 band is fantastic. It's on the board. Uh, Boss, G, G7. Boss G7. Wonderful. Um, Free the Tone do a really good programmable one. They do, and they're programmable. Of money. Yeah. Source Audio do a really, really good programmable one. Yep. Um, there's a lot of good ones out there. I think the danger is you could uh, you'd be using a sledgehammer to crack a nut here. What you want is a very specific boost at a very specific set of frequencies, so it shouldn't be that hard. Mm. Um, it might be worth doing a bit of research into what that mid-boost is actually doing, how many dB at what frequency. Mm -hmm. And it could be that you could recreate that um, fairly simply. Um, yeah, good luck. Good luck. Um, Victor Gustafsson. Hello, Victor. Hello, he's Victor. From, he's from Sweden, or at least he is in Sweden. He says, welcome back. I'm looking for my first Gibson as well as a P90 guitar. Mm. Would you go ES330 or standard Les Paul 50s gold top? 
I don't have a Gibson Solid, but an Ibanez AM93. Oh, boy. Uh, the TPS ATB episode slowly ruins me. So, right. A 330 may be a, really, a good sounding 330 is one of the best guitars easily. It's so, I, I don't know what it is, but the, the way that thing's put together, the clarity in that thing, it's, you know, as opposed to say a 335 uh, uh, with like P90s, obviously, you know, it's a different thing, but you know what I mean? That it's such a different sounding thing. It's, yeah, completely different. Uh, it's, and it's, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So your Ibanez is a semi-hollow, smaller body thing. I guess what might answer the question is, when you play the Ibanez, do you want more of a hollow or do you want more kind of tighter? Let's put it another way. Um, the more solid you make that guitar and the smaller the body, the more it's going to punch in the mid range, be tight, hold on to distortion and all those things. The more you increase the size of that body and the more air you put in it, the more air there is going to be around the note. The very different envelope on the front of that note um, in terms of the sort of, it's much less like that. That's what a solid body with a P90 does, yep. does that. A hollow body guitar with a P90 does that. There you go. There you go. Explained it by dancing. David um, Tompkins says, I throw coconuts at guitarists with poor tone and I find it massively, massively lowers my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Don't throw coconuts at them. The poor guys just, just point them to the, to the channel. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Um, also, what volume do you play at? If you play really loud, yeah, and you have the, really good point. You have the the luck to play loud. You'll get a lot of fun out of a solid body you will. P90s. So the 330 is going to present different challenges at volume. Big challenges yeah. at volume. You you will find it almost impossible to stop it feeding back at volume, even yeah. with just mild gain. Yeah. However, if you do play at low volume, that can be such a great advantage yeah. because yeah, yeah. where it's hard to get a solid body guitar going at long at low volume, resonating the resonance yeah, and the yeah. sort of player feedback of a hollow body at low volume is a Pretty really special. satisfying thing. Yeah. So hopefully some of that would help. Yep. Indeed. And. Um, a nice, I don't know, either a used Gibson Memphis 330 with VOS finish is a really spectacularly good looking thing. Yep. Um, Paul, the bearded one, downing. What are you downing, Paul? That's what I want to know. He's he says, meat. audience, how's it going? Looking for an always on spring reverb to go into a Marshall Origin 20 for practicing at home. Does anything immediately spring to mind? An always on spring reverb. J Rocket Boing. J Rocket Boing is a it, really good shout. If they still make it. Um, the crazy tube circuits White Whale, if you want to have some fun, that's got a tremolo in it and a real spring. Also, Paul, check out the Anna Sounds, A-N-A -A Sounds range of stuff. They do a really interesting take on a genuine proper reverb tank controlled by a pedal, which you can do things like increase the overdrive into the pedal, into the reverb. You can change the dwell time, the EQ, and a bunch of other stuff. Really cool take on analog reverb. But if you want something simple, J-Rocket Boing. Yeah. Um, there is a reverb show coming out this Friday. Yep. That might help you as well. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Good. Um, is Dev saying, please stop? <laughs> uh, a guitar Hack says, I just wanted to say I've been watching you guys for years and I've learned a ton. Awesome job, guys. Thank, thank you, you, Guitar Hack. Thank you, Guitar Hack. Cheers, thank mate. You. And thank you, BV. Uh, right, I do believe, Dan, this is our last question. Okay. Uh, is that, and it's not a question, and I think it is a great place to end the show, Jim. Thank you for this. Jim Leininger. 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 Sorry, Jim. Jim <laughs> Leininger. It's Leininger. Says... 
Somewhere between completely accurate reproduction mm -hmm. and completely original is where all musicians actually live. Yeah, right. We should embrace that and move on. Jim, what a fantastic way to end the show. Mm, very good, Jim. Well Thank done. Thank you. Yeah. Embrace that and move on. That's what everyone should have printed behind their eyelids. Yeah. And the... then you wouldn't be able to see it. <laughs> We are the other focus. <laughs> right, Dan and I going for a meat feast. Yes. Thank um, you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, join us on Friday for reverbs. the reverbs. That's going to be fun. The question is, I've got reverb in my amp. What do I need a reverb pedal for? Very good question. Very good question. Yeah. Brilliant. Have a fantastic week. Thanks again. Uh, and we'll see you on Friday. Uh, oh, yeah. I have to turn it off. Oh, you got to turn it off. Yeah. The meat isn't going to cook itself. <laughs> Keep talking about meat, down. Ah, oh, man. I got a barbecue for a preemptive birthday present, and I cannot wait to get it going.